First, in our agenda, we'll have the approval of the agenda. So moved, Peter. So moved by Peter. Second, David. Seconded by Councilor Parker. Okay. Any other um, comments or additions? Hearing none, all those in favor of signal happy saying aye. Aye. Motion right at nay. Motion carried. Next, we have the approval of the minutes for February 22nd. So moved. Moved by Councilor Turner, seconded by Councilor Elliott. Any corrections or omissions in the minutes? Council one. Just one typo on page seven. Um, we're sending a grand total. This is the deputy municipal, which would be the deputy municipal treasurer. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Anything else? Okay, here we go. I'll call for the vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Contra minded nay. Motion carried. So I want to thank you for indulging me for a moment, uh, Madam Chair, with an item that is not on the agenda purposely, as there may have been objections that these two ladies know. Uh, <laughs> 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 so it is the motion that we formally announce the retirement of two of our beloved and much appreciated employees, Carolyn McIntosh, 44 years, and Jane Johnson, 22 years both ending their time with us at the end of this week. Both ladies will be remembered as outstanding colleagues that led by example through hard work and commitment each day that they were here. Their contributions in the office have been an integral part of this municipality's success and they will be truly missed. I would now ask that Warden Parker address the committee and further recognize these wonderful employees and friends. I asked this community to join me in the center at the CEO. Thank you. 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 Okay, as uh, uh, Mr. Khan has said, uh, this is a very historic occasion. We're losing 66 years of uh, organizational history here. That's, that's a lot to lose at one time. I can't remember the years I've been here ever losing anywhere close to that. Uh, and so, first of all, on, on behalf of uh, taxpayers of this county, uh, residents of the rural county, I want to thank those of you for the work you've done because. You've served them so well with proficiency and efficiency. And uh, that, that's a big thing uh, to this county. You've run this uh, job very well. And uh, like I said, one day we were having a shared service meeting here. And oh, yeah, you can pass on. Who says? One of the other mayors said, I said, Carolyn says. And this time it's when Carolyn says rules. Uh, and, and Jane, I know you've been here at many, many meetings, uh, night after night, you come in some nights, there's three or four meetings in the same week. They're Jane consistently there all the time. So uh, you've both done wonderful work for the county. And on behalf of us as individuals, too, individual counselors, uh, the kindness and the caring that you show to all of us, uh, you know, it's not easy when you first arrive here trying to figure your way around and stuff. And uh, both of you ladies were very good to help all of us. Uh, you know, sort of figure out how things are done. Uh, so we're going to be a bit lost for sure. Um, I did want to mention uh, a little bit about history here. And uh, I, I want to mention that, you know, Carolyn's been here since 1978, I believe. Some of them were still wearing horses in there, I think. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so she's been here, you know, uh, first under, under uh, Warden George Reed. And then my uh, late uncle, Warden K. Y. Parker, and then Warden Hank uh, Donwell, and Alfred McDonald, and Ronnie Bailey, and then myself. So she's seen uh, a lot of towns and goals, and, and Jane's seen some of them, just not as many. Uh, but uh, always was able to work with whoever was, uh, was in that position, and uh, worked with many, many counselors over the years. Uh, some of them no longer with us, but uh, I think of all of them tonight too. Uh, you know, I had a whole list I was going to read out, but then I said that's too long. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, 
I thank you on behalf of us counselors that are here, but also the many, many counselors that you uh, that have served both of you over the past. So uh, thanks isn't enough, but well, this is going to be about. <laughs> 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 anyway, give any yes. Okay. Thank you. Well, you never came with horse and buggy, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I came to stay four days in a row and I would sweat you. <laughs> <laughs> So when we're panicking next week, who do we call? Can't not be okay. Well, I'm going to say that I'm going to say that I'm going to say that I'm I guess Suzanne's going to have to put that over on a piece of paper and tell us what we're supposed to do. <laughs> All right, moving on with our agenda this evening, we have the County Volunteer Ground and Search and Rescue Program Overview. Tonight, we have Peggy Simkin, Director of Treasure, and Charlie Strickland, Search Director. So, welcome to our council this evening, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much for allowing us to come tonight. I don't have to do the introduction, <laughs> and I'm going to turn it right over to my colleague here, Charlie Strickland, who's going to explain his position on our team, just briefly. This will come as a shock to some of my members, too, but uh, as search director, oh, thank you very much. As search director, uh, my job basically is to have a team ready for a search. Uh, I don't, uh, I wear multiple hats like a lot of us do, and I don't, uh, I'm also a search manager, so I could be in charge of the search with wearing that hat. But search director, I have the responsibility of having the team ready for a search. And that involves, I have the safety committee, the uh, operations committee, the planning committee, and the training committee that fall under me. And I report to the, uh, the uh, executives. All right, with that brief explanation, I would like to ask if everyone received their packet that Carolyn passed out by email, basically, and I hope that you've had a little bit of a chance to review that. Um, we're going to be looking at just our, this is probably the third year that I have submitted a request for annual funding, and I call it the 2022 annual funding contribution request. And that uh, implies that all um, municipal units uh, are included, uh, Victor and Glasgow, Trenton, Stonehenge, and Westville, and the county, of course, and also uh, we have included uh, as well uh, the First Nations, Victor and Lenny First Nations in on that. So this year we waited until the uh, 2021 population statistics came on so that we could calculate, recalculate it properly. So what you see is that calculation based on that. And I would like to draw your attention to the amount that we are requesting from you. Um, the municipality of Victor County, we're asking $5,988, which we would want to also um, contribute uh, the equal as well. Um, and just going back to last year, you have done that. And I want to thank you personally, as well as from the team, for receiving your um, the funding request that we asked for. And it was $4,587, just so that people want to clarify that. And from that, we, we put most of that towards our building fund, which was in desperate need. And it's still in requiring some uh, I hope that you've had a chance to view in the packet this little flyer, which has said it's it's about the Pickett County Volunteer Ground Search and Rescue activities for 2021, and in that it shows you what we do, for, what we did for some fundraisers, and also indicated uh, what we did for training events, which were quite extensive considering we had COVID. Um, we tried to work around all the events and things that we were required to do and had to come up with very uh, stringent COVID restriction um, adaptations for our team. And um, it seemed to still work. We still have some activities. And then the building repairs are also in that. 
and it indicates what we did in that stage, but we, we had previous stages of work on the building as well to allow it to house our equipment, which is very important to us. Um, we have an, an incident command post as well as um, uh, four by four that hauls it, and we have a cube van that is called is our logistics truck, and that has a lot of the equipment that would um, supplement the ICP. And so those that type of equipment has sensitive equipment in it, and without that building, it would be very difficult to have maintain it in any way. It would uh, have degradation on it on that equipment. Um, there are some teams that do not have buildings, that's true, but they are fighting all the time the weather and the elements. So going back to what I'm talking about, I guess, is that in looking at our request for last year, we noted that most of the towns did give and municipality, they did not always get, we did not always receive the amount that we requested. We requested a total of $9,730 last year. And of that $796 in uh, night, sorry, $7,964 was received. So we were short about $1,766. Of the amount that we were supposed to give, it would have been this full $9,730 that we were, we were to contribute as well as far as our contribution. And we raised, through fundraising and donations, $15,000. Um, and during that contribution, we, we have met our requirements. And we are asking again that we have the commitment from the municipality to meet with us again. Um, so the administration, we can go through any details you'd like in questions if you want, want to go through that. But instead, right at the moment, I'd like to turn everything over to my search director, who's, who's going to talk about a little bit about the projects that we are upcoming, that are upcoming in our, for our team, so you can get an idea of what's going on there as well. Hello again. Uh, just a little bit about our projects. We started a project in 2021 that we're just completing now. Uh, we identified a need to improve our communications after a review of a search that was held in Victor County uh, during 2021, and this started the project. Uh, that, commun that, com uh, excuse me, that communications project is just about finished now. We were able to qualify for funding for the Emergency Service Provider Fund that provided 75% of the cost of this $13,000 plus project. This gave us a 29-foot telescopic antenna mast, which will effectively more than double the height of our radio antenna, and this will give us improvements in our operating range of our radios during searches, uh, which was the, one of the identified problems when we had that search. For 2022, uh, we're going to look at modernizing and updating our incident command post and our logistics truck. Uh, we obtained the trailer in 2005 and converted it into our incident command post. Over time, it has had modifications, but we uh, find that the layout is not optional for our present needs, and also there is a weight distribution issue, which we have to correct. Uh, the logistics truck will also be updated. Uh, originally constructed, it was a logistics and uh, personnel support vehicle, so that our members could take shelter in it on benches, so there was equipment stored in bins under the benches. However, however, over time, we found that the personnel support function was not being used, and especially with COVID-19. So the present plan and upgrade of the logistics vehicle is to support the work in the ICP, and this will involve the logistics truck to carry the items that we remove from the ICP uh, because of weight issues. Uh, this project has it had its initial acceptance by the 144 construction engineering flight based at Victo. Uh, we are awaiting final approval, as well as approval by the team for the project, and of course the funding. Uh, we are still working on the budget for this project. Uh, this is also outside our normal budgeting. When we can start this project, will depend on the contributions received from the 2022 annual funding request. Our budget expenses have to be covered before we can go forward with this project. Uh, the incident command post and our logistics can also be called out to, to support other agencies within the county, as well as with searches across Nova Scotia. Okay, I'll just continue on training. 
uh, training for our team follows the school year. So uh, our training year runs from September to June. <clears throat> Excuse me, this works best uh, with families. Uh, Ground Search and Rescue in Nova Scotia is 100% volunteer, and we want to make sure our members come home with their families safe after every training and search event. We have made it mandatory that new members must receive a new member orientation, which includes the basic searcher course before they are added to our college system. Our training, regardless of the basic topic, will still have elements of safety in it. Uh, COVID-19 has affected our group as it has all aspects of society. But as mentioned in the submission from our team, we still had over 600 hours of training last year. We are basically just getting it going again now for 2022, but plan to support to surpass last year's numbers. We offer training at the, at the team level with our courses on new member orientation, uh, Incidents Command System 100, uh, which is used across the country and is mandatory for new members. Uh, Searcher, which has nine modules and takes 40 hours to complete. Team Leader, which has two modules, a minimum of 12 hours. Safety Officer, for those that want to take it, is an eight hour course. We also teach people to do the check in and check out, logistics at the searches, uh, computer operations, and we have several programs that are basically unique to search and rescue. We also <coughs> excuse me, offer courses as necessary through instructors outside our team. St. John Ambulance Standard First Aid with uh, CPR at Level C and ADD. Uh, this is the only course our team members have to pay for, but the team pays 50% of the cost for those that want to take it. No, but we have trained safety officers on the team and those safety officers are required to have first aid, so the team pays 100% of their training. Uh, one of the other, uh, two of the other courses we get outside our own uh, uh, trainers is marine radio training uh, for the restricted operators certificate for maritime. Uh, we have, we sometimes work with Coast Guard Auxiliary and Coast Guard during shoreline searches. Uh, that's a one day cost for the uh, for the course and the exam, and it's $100 per member, and we pay 100% of that. Air radio training uh, is a one day course, uh, but right now that this, we're able to get that uh, for no cost. Provincial level, uh, we have a search managers course that's run by the association. Uh, that's a 40 hour course, and uh, the lost person behavior course is another 16 hours. And that's $35 per member paid by the team. So that's an idea of some of the training uh, that we offer to our team members. Um, I don't know if there's any questions on that just at the moment, but do you want to have any questions for me? I'll open the floor up to counselors. Excellent presentation. Thank you so much for coming this evening. Um, we appreciate it. And thank you for sharing the information. Oh, one partner. I, I didn't realize it was me, and I thought I would just stop for a yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I just want to ask, I think I asked last year, what are bracelets that you can get for uh, people that wander off? Uh, uh, and Roger, Roger went, Yeah, and so that project's still ongoing in the county. I yes, it is. And uh, how many people do you have with bracelets? Uh, I, so my last number was 14. It's 14. 14, uh, 14 members. That's usually it's uh, first it was brought into Nova Scotia to help with Alzheimer's and dementia. Uh, oh, okay, thank you. It was brought into Nova Scotia for Alzheimer's and dementia, uh, but we find most of our clients are uh, on the autistic spectrum. The more children or young people. Uh, yes, for the most part, there are some adults, but they're mostly young people. And uh, it's very good. It's basically the the bracelet looks like a watch when it's just saw a white face. It's a radio transmitter. Uh, if they wander, the caregiver calls 911, and the uh, 911 calls us, and we deploy. Uh, and of course, they'll also call police, but we would be deploying while as soon as the call comes in. Uh, we have three kits that have uh, radio direction finders, as well as TMR portable radios, everything that person needs to uh, respond. And we respond with uh, two persons with each kit. 
and they would they would go right to uh, the area that the child was last or the adult was last seen, and they uh, have an omnidirectional microphone or antenna that goes on the roof. They switch that on, and then we have to go below 40 kilometers an hour so that we don't miss the beeps. And then when we get a beep, stop the car, report to the other two teams, and head in. And basically, it's you're following a bearing on the rate on the uh, transmitter. Uh, I'll also mention that you know there's some concern people have had with uh, these things identifying where the child is uh, all the time. There's been some concern in the, in the U.S. with this, but it's not an issue in that nobody monitors those frequencies unless we're following it. And then we we set the radio to the frequency, we're given the radio frequency for that child, and then we or an adult, and then we we find them, hopefully. In Nova Scotia right now, uh, our team has not had a call in since we started this, but uh, the teams that have, once they arrive on site, they have the person within 25 minutes. It's pretty invaluable if you're, uh, you know, a young person or an older person with dementia or whatever, and you have no idea where they're at, so you just don't read in on. I don't know how many people in our county uh, are aware. I uh, wonder that that's available. Is there a cost to uh, there, there is a cost to it, not from us. We we are volunteers, and our equipment is paid was paid for. Uh, but the, uh, the there is a twenty five dollar a month charge for the batteries. We we basically have volunteers that go up once a month, meet with the family and caregiver, and change the batteries on the uh, on the device. Um, and that that's the cost. That's our cost and the cost to the to the individual. And there's a I'm not 100 percent up on this. I think that it's around three hundred dollars for the initial login with Project Lifesaver International, which is uh, the, uh, the the group we deal with is Project Lifesaver Association of Nova Scotia uh, plans. And you can look at they're, they're what they have a website. But uh, yeah, there is an initial cost. Uh, for it, uh, non-refundable. And again, it's not paid to us. It goes to the uh, group that, that runs this. And then the uh, uh, after that, it's just twenty-five dollars a month, which is it still can add up. But we've found that some agencies we've approached will support uh, children if asked. So that, that it's, uh, it's it's very good that way. That there's a lot of community spirit that will help them. I, I, I may have drafted down this before, but we should promote it on our uh, with our communications officer on our website and that type of stuff. Uh, and I, I agree with you that in many communities, if a person or a family needed this, community would kind of find a way to put the funding for it if, if they weren't yes. able to, uh, to do that themselves. So uh, I think it needs to be broadcast a little wider, maybe, so that uh, more people can take you. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Warden Parker. Uh, Councilor David Parker. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and I want to thank you, too, for coming and, and uh, filling us in on a few of the details. I've been aware of Grand Central Vesta for a, a long time. In fact, I think it was about five years ago, I was approached by a lady in my district, and my suggestion to her at that time was, you know, you need to approach the county and, and become like a fire director. But there's a, but there's a, Contribution every year. This, this is basically doing the same thing. I was going to ask the very same question my brother did, but uh, within the last month, we had an elderly individual in our community who went missing. He was physically able, mentally, he couldn't remember how to get back home. The good news is he was found, taken to the hospital. And, but I'm aware of a couple of cases over the years where elderly people with dementia wandered off and all they found was their remains. So about the year to live. Um, so that I believe you provide an extremely valuable service. You also do uh, searches, uh, evidence searches, do you? If, if asked, um, it, it's not a common occurrence, but yes, when it requested by the police, we will do evidence searches. Yeah. Um, I just mentioned that you were saying well, uh, people wandering away. The uh, dementia or Alzheimer's are some of the worst searches we have because. The person doesn't know that they're lost and they don't always answer to their name when called. Uh, but the, sometimes when we find them, uh, I'll give you an example from the South Shore team. One of the teams in the South Shore encountered, encountered a gentleman sitting under a tree. Oh, great, we found him. So they walk up towards him and he gives them hell for coming into his living room. 
So they had to back off. Team leader went forward and knocked in front of him, knocked on the tree. And uh, he said, come on in. And team leader said, hey, we're, uh, we're up for a walk. Uh, would you care to join us? Oh, yeah, I'd love to do that. And then he came up with them. Because once we find them, we can't have, take charge of them unless they are agreed to come with us. And usually they're fine, you know, it's, but we have that issue. So it's, it's always a concern when we get a call and it's uh, it's a dementia call. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. I know just right in my local community, I can recall three or four of them over the last probably 20 years. They all ended well. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yes. They have the potential to end tragically. Uh, just all I want to say is uh, I certainly will support them the funding they've asked for and uh, keep up the good work. Thank you very much. Thank you. I should just yes, yes. mention though that uh, we don't self activate other than getting a call from 911 and responding without the police. When there is a call for a search, that calls me to 911 for a missing person. The police decide whether or not to call us out. Uh, this, we not really call first responders because you can't call us and us, we respond. You have to call 911 and the police make the decision whether to call us out. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Deputy Warden Wayne Murray. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you both for coming and telling us about the When I was talking to Peggy on the phone, you mentioned that maybe it'd be a good idea if some of the counselors were there in senior operation. So I'm just putting that out there. Yes, you have to come up you to come and see us. Oftentimes, fundraising uh, creates at least an opportunity for people to take a look at our ICP or uh, logistics because we do take them on site and uh, part of that is recruiting too and uh, more we'd like everyone to at least get an idea of what type of equipment we have and um, how how the equipment is run um, anytime if, you, if you'd like okay i'll take that under the wing and uh, <laughs> if i can get a bunch of counselors i get in contact with them that's so great Thank you, Deputy Warden. Um, Councillor Don Butler. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. My question of the presenters is, uh, can you share with us the number of incidents that you've responded to in the past year? Uh, four is what we responded to last year, but it varies from year to year. Uh, I haven't had the numbers in front of me. Uh, I think we got a couple of years ago, it was nine. Uh, it could be four or five. Uh, I'll point out Colchester, you know, just our next door neighbor, uh, was over 20. Uh, they do have some other uh, additional equipment that we don't have. They have a, an Argo ambulance and they can respond uh, into the field, into the woods uh, with trained uh, people that have uh, advanced paramedic training. So that they get a couple more calls than we do. But uh, that, that, that's an average year is about four or five. Now, when I say, for last year, um, three of those were outside Victor County. So uh, it's it's like mutual aid with fire departments. Like if uh, if a team has to search and they start the search and they realize partway through the first operational period that they don't have enough clues that they need to uh, anticipate replacement, then they'll call in other teams. And so uh, they we would show up after 12 hours uh, they've been on site and replaced them, or perhaps in the case of uh, somebody very young, somebody very old, um, severe medical condition, or a storm coming, we might we call it loading up the front end, and, and several teams would respond immediately. We would be called out by the police and respond to uh, have to get the numbers out there uh, in order to find the person in a shorter time period. Thank you. May I also respond to your question? Uh, we, we also have um, relations with uh, Remo and have had response there when requested. But we have to be uh, remember the. Uh, oh, yeah. We have done those types of operations, although they're not as prevalent as surges for us. Uh, also, we have Adventure Smart program, which is uh, going to the schools, for instance, to do uh, things like uh, tree. Um, which is a volunteer situation where you go in and teach puppetry to the children. And we've done that at uh, the school here in Pinto as well. And we would do more of that. Um, but COVID, of course, had a, a real hard, uh, so that created a hard circumstance for us. 
and we very much enjoy that. Uh, it's part of our prevention uh, for loss, for a lost person. We want to prevent it before we and also allows uh, children to learn how to survive in a situation like that. So there are other programs that are part of us that search is maybe part, but it's not all. Thank you, um, Councilor Butler. Uh, Councilor Chester Dillon. Thank you very much. Uh, also, I'd like to say thank you for coming out this evening. Just before we, uh, I asked you the other question you people did put in this year for the community grant. Right. Okay, a couple of times that didn't happen. It made it pretty difficult to get you some money. That's the most important thing to remember always by the end of February. Uh, something else that I wanted to mention, and I'm going to talk about a little later in this evening, uh, is the exhibition. Uh, hopefully, the exhibition is going to run this year, and maybe you could have a a little information place or a little place to recruit some people on in the break right there. You know how the different uh, associations in there and uh, anything at all would be maybe a help. If, if you only got two new people, it would still be better than not doing it. So, and, and you know, as always, that's in September. But anyway, uh, I'd, I'd like to thank you for everything you do. Ever since I've been on council in 2000, we were always able to support uh, search and rescue. I remember how Adam, the former deputy warden, Mel McLean, he really, really took an interest back in the beginning. And I, uh, everybody always supported him. It was never a problem. Always forget the information and what you need in time, right? Okay. Thank you very much. Sir, any further questions? Yeah, you actually like to come out? Yes, go ahead. I just wanted to summarize. Okay. I just wanted to say that we are, we are anticipating higher costs this year, and, and training is going to be a little bit more difficult, we expect, because of the economic conditions that people are going to be under volunteer, particularly. Who, by the way, upgrade themselves and do whatever they need to do to get ready. Um, Administratively, more hours were required to accommodate all the circumstances on the court. We spent thousands thousand administrative hours to just prepare and get everybody ready for the searches that, so that they were under the COVID restriction requirements. And then the ad adaptation and development of uh, state of emergency protocols and um, procedures kept our director and he busy uh, trying to just stay fluid. And we're still doing that. We're still going to be doing that face to face with fundraising. It's still more difficult as many venues are still on. And but we have fundraising events to schedule and we're prepared to do that. So we're asking a lot of our teams are struggling in this province. The ones that have continued support from their community can continue to provide service when they're called upon. And our team needs that continued support. We appreciate this annual commitment. This commitment will give us the foundation for our recruitment, our training, our basic supplies and equipment. Please continue to contribute to the requested contribution and encourage other contributors to do the same. We are allocating with all allocating, we're all with the all allocating, I'm sorry, their share, the contribution. Our team can continue to service our community and other grants our teams. Thank you very much for this opportunity for your opportunity. It's just like a second. We have another question here. Um, go ahead, Councillor Boyles. I was just when I was listening here, I was just wondering, what is the age? What, what is your age for your uh, for your organization? Uh, well, the we. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> Slow uh, The uh, minimum age to uh, train is 19 years old. However, we accept junior members from 16 to 19. So 16 is the minimum. Uh, we haven't set a maximum. Uh, I'm 69 and I'm still going. Um, you know, it's up to the individual basically. Usually, what happens is the uh, as the uh, lakes start to go or the ambition starts to go, then you end up in the command post. So you'll see some older people running computers that you wouldn't think that they would be doing, but it's hard to get a 12 year old at three in the morning. So 
We, we and if they're willing to, to come to a search, we have jobs for them. You know, that's the same with, with any of our members. You never have enough people on a search, but qualified people. And that's that's always an issue. We have uh, approximately 62 members, I believe, right now, but they can't all be available three o'clock in the morning or maybe tonight into tomorrow. Uh, some people, you know, could be ill. Some people could be away. Some people have their jobs. So the more, the bigger uh, group of volunteers we have, then the more liable we are to have enough that we need at a search, which is about 30, is a minimum that we'd like to see with the right training. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for coming this evening. We appreciate uh, sharing your um, what your organization does, and uh, we really appreciate it. So thank you. Yes. Do you want to come and have a seat? So our next presentation tonight, um, we have the we have Ron Clark, who is the arena manager at the Hector Arena, and um, he's going to talk to us this evening about the Hector Arena ice planning project. So welcome, Ron. I'll turn it over to you. I think I could probably call out loud enough. You can hear me. Can everybody hear me? Sorry. Thank you very much for allowing me this time to uh, speak tonight. Uh, you should all have the package that we sent out for our grant application. You, you all went through it. That was the, what the request was. No. If you don't have it. No, that, that is with the administration right now. And then I'll go up to the grant committee okay. at that time. Okay, sorry. So our, I guess we're here tonight, I'm here tonight to request some funding for our new rice plant at the rink. Um, and the way we, the way we did our budget up, request, and I went to the same for the town of Pecto. We're requesting 35,000 this year, 35,000 in 2023. That gives both the town and the county room to, to maneuver their budget to help us out. And then we're gonna take on the, the debt until this gets paid off, basically. Uh, we got a lot of funding in place now. We've received $150,000 from the uh, province rent revitalization plan um, program. We received a uh, good word here about a week and a half ago. Check will be cut through uh, New Horizons for Seniors, that program. Uh, we requested, and that was a bonus, didn't think. Uh, we got all 25,000 there, the maximum we could get. Didn't think we would get that. We thought we might get maybe $5,000, dollars uh, On the phone a lot the last couple of weeks with the COA. It looks like we're getting 50,000 from them. Uh, we will borrow the remainder. We've already been in touch with Noble. So the funding's in place to, to do this plan this year. The plan is ordered. Wrote a check for a down payment of $57,500. Got a nice hat, too. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, the plan is ordered. It should be here mid to late July. Installed in August. Ready to go late September. Uh, yeah, $475,000 is the total cost. That's, that's the installation. Everything. So. Um, Anyway, I'll, I'll just turn it over to questions, like ask me questions. Uh, what do you want to do here? Every time I talk, I can turn it yes. Okay, I'll open the floor up to questions. Uh, Councilor David Parker. First of all, Ron, thank you. Thank you. I knew you'd give a nice, short, succinct presentation. <laughs> um, will there be uh, Will there be any? Uh, Let's call it interference with the uh, with the exhibition when this is being installed. No, no. So off to the side. Well, it'll be in the you know where the plant room is anyway, David. Yeah. So even if even if the work wasn't finished, they can continue their work in there, and it should be finished by end of August anyway. So 
and, and what type of refrigerant being used? Yes. It is called R513A. And it's the uh, it's the best refrigerant right now for global warming potential. So that's why we, we chose this that was what we had four we had four options. I guess I should have started with that too. We went to Simcoe, got a price from them out of the world, and it was ammonia. We can't do ammonia in our rink. We would have to build a building outside because our rink is the room that the plant sits in is certainly not airtight. So we would have to build a, a standalone truck structure outside the rink to have the ammonia plant. If you're talking, we were looking at eight hundred thousand dollars. So that one got shoved away. Had a gentleman in from uh, IB Story, Randy knows this guy. Yeah, he was good, great. One point three million dollars. Yeah, wonderful. So anyway, we had two options from Berg. This is the plant we were going with for Berg Chile. One was an outside option, which had its benefits, had its had its negatives. The one benefit was we would not, not ever need another ticketed operator. That's the that was the main benefit. The negatives were well, it sat outside for one thing, so you get a five hundred thousand dollar piece of equipment sitting out on a slab. I wasn't keen on it, and at, and at our commission meeting, it, it seemed like nobody was keen on it. So we shoved that one, and it was more expensive than our final option anyway. It was another inside plan. We will need a ticketed operator moving forward. Right now, I have a gentleman working at the rink that's a ticketed operator, and if he leaves, I have another gentleman that will do what Wayne Otter did for us for years, is just some, come in a few times a week and sign off on our plan to keep us legal. So. We got our, our bases covered and we went with the, the cheaper option. So I'm doing a little math here, Ron. I got up to about uh, maybe 365,000. Yeah. 70 from ourselves, 70 from the town. Yeah. 150 to the rink revitalization. Yeah. The horizon is 25, possibly 50 from a co op. That's uh, I, I, sorry, I, I think it's, I think that's. I have a really good feeling about it. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Still, so leaves you a little over 100 short. Uh, will you be going to the community as we did a decade ago? Uh, we we don't have plans to go to the community. We have a little bit of money in the bank, David, that we've been salting away um, for the last number of years. And the way I've done it, my members, uh, and also the Sutherland Harris are on board to help us. I think they're not firm. And Legion is firm. Their firm for ten thousand, um, but anyway, Solomon Harris is looking good. I think going around their table at their meetings, I think we have their support. So the way I I have broken down, David, by the time we uh, close in the year twenty twenty four, two years from now, it'll be paid for. But I know I know we've dealt with Noble before, yep. and uh, the Hector Reina and the Clarks in particular have been very good to the word. So that, that's why Noble will almost unhesitatingly uh, give you the money. Um, can't say this is the final piece because ranks always take money. Um, they're, they're, it's an expensive proposition. But over the last decade, we put well over a hundred dollars, and so that came from here. So came from college, a lot of them came from community, and all kinds of other fundraisers. Um, and this is getting close, and we knew when we did that, we knew that the plant, well, what is it? It's close to 50 years old, or it is 50 years old. I know that it would have to be renewed. Uh, is there any money, has there been any approach made, or is there any money available from the federal government? Because this is really a climate change issue, right? To switch you to a more uh, friendly refrigerator. Well, the ECOA is both those grants I spoke about the New Horizons and the ECOA grant are the feds, but I think there will be money in the next fiscal year, we'll say, for green and for green. There's always stuff out there. So yeah. the next time we look, we're going to look into that. I'll fill in every grant that we can to uh, right. Um, I thought of something there when you were saying now I can't think of what I was going to say, but oh you mentioned about going out to the community. And I've been asked that several times by different people. And what I say to them is, if you feel like writing a check, we'll give you a charitable, we'll give you a, 
a tax lien. But as far as going out to the community, from what the business community, <coughs> excuse me, have been through the last two years, I'm not too keen. I think we can do this. I think we can do it with with municipality's help, you know, uh, Southern Harris's help, and, and you know, and, and paying for stuff ourselves. And if people come forward, wonderful, right? Great. We, we're not going to turn them down. We'll say yes. We'll take a five dollar check. We'll take a five hundred dollar check, right? It's all it's all money. But, you know, it's been a rough it's been a rough couple of years for the for the businesses. And I have written two letters to both. To both banks, a letter to each bank, I'm sorry, um, Royal and Scotia, to, to go up the food chain a bit to see if there's any money. I mean, I know they're barely scraping by, but you know, maybe they could, they might be able to help us, you know. <laughs> I, I appreciate your humor and I appreciate your efforts on behalf of the rink. Um, the Hector Arena, uh, I would suggest, is um, one of, if not the most successful rink in the country. It runs with some help. Okay. They all need some help, some need more than others. Um, but it, it's they have a routine. But simple, it's a routine. Um, Dara, Madam Chair, can attest to that. Other than the staff on board. Um, and that's why they are where they are. Uh, Bob Naylor, the late Bob Naylor, said about 2009 or 10 when. It became clear that a, a double rink uh, facility was going to get built uh, over near Nebraska. He said, We've got no choice. We either get busy renovating or we get busy closing. And we chose to the renovation record. And uh, we're in real good shape. So I certainly will be supporting the request. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Councillor Parker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I am impressed, uh, Ron, with your numbers that you have and the funding uh, that you've been able to gather up. It's not easy to consider my funding in this day and age, and uh, so uh, it appears that you have it pretty well under control uh, with some some borrowed money, but uh, you feel positive that you can pay that back. I just want to say that, you know, anything I heard about yourself, whether, you know, from our chair here tonight or from the brother Dave and others, that you have done a very good job with them there in Victor. So I thank you for that. Our rinks are so important uh, to our, you know, we put a lot of emphasis on recreation here and uh, this council and uh, rinks play a big part in that. Uh, and every rink has its own challenges for sure. But uh, to see you uh, have the figures kind of under control like that is a good thing. Uh, and I, I do agree with you not going to the community unless you really have to. Uh, the community right now is being asked to help certainly with the uh, library cost uh, project in there. And there's only so much in the community too to go around. And then uh, considering inflation and, and the tough times that people have done in the last two years, and you said that uh, it's kind of hard to keep going back to that well. Uh, so if you've been able to find it, uh, other uh, sources, it's still taxpayer money, it's all come from government somewhere for the most part. Uh, but that's all uh, right. Uh, those programs are there, and if you've been able to find them and access them, all, all the better. So thank you, uh, you know, for the work you've done. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, yeah, I guess I, I guess your brother was on the commission for quite a number of years, and then Darth took over. I guess I got them all back all right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm fairly confident that this will be well. This is a big project. It's a big undertaking. Get it done. There's, like David said, uh, sorry, Councilman Parker said, uh, there's uh, there's always something. There's always something, right? But to get this done, well, that's something down and paid for, and, and hopefully no debt. It's still a little bit in our in our savings or whatever your capital account, whatever you want to call it. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Wharton, and um, Councilman Randy Palmer. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Well, do you have the book? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when the rent's probably easy, say no. Probably no any to nothing like that. The last two years, uh, I know by being involved with the Thorn Rink that COVID hit us hard. You know, that it hit you guys just as hard. And it's hard to get over that. That income that you lost because <clears throat> that's 
when you don't have the money to to replace it, it's, and there's no going on board, it's hard. It's hard to come up with that extra income to pay that money back. It's very hard. But I, and I know these uh, councillors know why you're replacing the ice plant. Would you want to mention that? Why, why it's being replaced? Just Yes, thank you. Thank you, Randy. Um, well, you, I guess you're on the same boat, and so is the Lincoln West. We're running what's called R22 free on. It's obsolete. It's not, uh, you can't buy it anyway. You can still buy it, but it's it's hard to come by. Uh, I think the Montreal Protocol, whatever year that was, that they, they, banned, they banned the production of it. So that, we've been, we've been talking about this for a few years now. So, yeah, it's, uh, you guys, Thorburn still run the R22, Westville, and us here. I don't know how many other rings around, but that, that's the reason we have to replace it is, is the free on R22. It's, uh, as far as the gases go, it's, it's the absolute worst for global warming potential. So that's why it was banned. And uh, it's, like I said, it's not made anymore, and it's very expensive. We have a, a full charge in our rink, I think 700 pounds. Uh, I don't, we're probably, Four to five hundred pounds in there right now. And we took a total loss of that. If we had a major leak breakdown, there's ten thousand dollars right there. If if you can find it. Right. So, thank you. Yeah. No, it's uh, and that's the reason we're looking ahead, and, and Wes was the same boat. And it's uh, everybody's fighting over money, and I had a long discussion with the federal government on Friday. It doesn't seem like there's a lot of money there. They're giving out right fifty thousand dollars. I mentioned, you know, these about the global warming and everything like that. You know, I thought there'd be funding available for not for profit organizations. Uh, there's so many people looking for it too, so that's that's the other thing. So. But no, Ron, it's a, it's a hard goal, and I know the town of Hifto and the county is very appreciative of, of your efforts and everything like that. So just keep us doing work, and I heard you staying on to 2030. So. I'm glad to know. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Um, yeah, Randy, Randy, you and I have spoken quite a bit about about the rings and, and, and the dilemmas we're in, right? And, and I must say, uh, I'm very lucky in, the, in this in our rink since I've taken over the core of volunteers that I have. Like, you need something done, like when we paint our lines in the ice, for instance, ten people show up to help you paint. You buy them a coffee. Uh, in three weeks time, less than three, well, yeah, three weeks from today, we'll be starting to pick up our mats and store them away underneath the bleachers there where we store them. There'll be a pallet jack and four volunteers there that day along with me, but, but, you know, so I am very fortunate to have to have that, uh, that kind of help, and, you know, the start of the year and the end of the year, and it's, uh, it's invaluable, so I'm very fortunate, so uh, I can't, I can take very little credit, there's no I in team, right? <laughs> so, thank you. So, any other questions or comments? Um, Ron, may I ask you to speak to, um, we, I know we talked about this at a committee level, about how our rink isn't just about ice, just about ice surface anymore. How is, you know, that is our, that is our main, but it's, we're, we're, we're kind of evolving what our, I guess, uh, what happens at our rink. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, well, I guess it was my second year there. We started to, uh, the question was asked me, like, we got a big space, but we walk in here. I said, sure. So we only had mats partway around and only one lane like partway around. So ended up getting some grants and <laughs> getting some people. And uh, one of our, one of the ladies that walks, her name is Ann Young. Aaron knows she's a, an old teacher of ours from the academy. And uh, she was instrumental in filling out some of these grants, giving us free mats, money for the mats. And actually, this this twenty five thousand dollar one through uh, through the New Horizons, she brought that to my attention, and, and we, her and I, Claire, uh, filled it out. And she called it Honey H U M I, help us make ice. Right. So because she knows, I guess she understands that the rink closes, well, there's nowhere to walk. Right. So the walkers are. Uh, between our, our walking and skating donations every week, <laughs> pay for our Zamboni propane. Like you get 100 bucks a week in a, in a bucket. You just put a bucket there and people throw it in until they need to or need or whatever. And 
adds up to about hundred dollars a week, which pays your propane for your Zamboni. But also we've evolved a little bit, as people on the commission know, we may end up, I think, at the end of September, opening a space upstairs in the mezzanine for a fitness center. That was talked about a lot. It was voted on at our at our commission and was approved, but then COVID struck twice and got delayed. But the plan is now for the for next September for a fitness center upstairs or so. We'll get a little rent revenue from that, and plus it'll attract maybe parents when their kids are, uh, you know, when they're playing hockey or practicing, can go up and go on a treadmill or whatever. You know, it should, it should be another call of course anyway. Hopefully. And we also have lacrosse and archery events. Also, oh, right. Yeah. Yeah, this, when we close the rink, the first event is uh, is an archery event on the 30th of April. Then the lacrosse starts first weekend of May. It runs, I'm not sure what it runs, because last year it was late starting and then late ending. And uh, it usually runs a couple of months. And then in the middle of that, we're going to have a jujitsu jiu event. On the weekend, so we had that last year with, with limited seating. So this year, apparently, is still good. We're allowed maximum seating. They should do very well. So the canteen finally opened. They've been open for two weekends now, so they'll get three more weekends in. So it's been a bad couple of years for them too. So anyway. thank you. Do you have any further questions, comments? Okay, hearing now. Thank you, Ron, for coming this evening. Thank you. And I'm uh, presenting on behalf of Hector Arena. And good presentation. Yeah, I appreciate all your time. Thank you. I accept checks, e transfer, whatever you got. <laughs> Take care. Thanks. Thanks, Ron. Thank you. Okay, moving on to our sixth agenda item tonight, we have the broadband project update from our CAO. So the uh, report was circulated earlier today. Um, I will just kind of touch on some of the highlights um, from the month of uh, February. Um, for the project. Um, so in general, the, the months of January, February continued with um, the uh, activities towards uh, installation of backbone fiber, as well as the uh, rapid uh, deployment uh, uh, network or the wireless network. Um, so the portion or portion of the um, fiber is um, what I guess we would say um, almost at the point of service ready. Um, so that is uh, uh, actually installing the drops to the homes. So there's 268 homes initially, um, but those will um, be connected. Um, the splicing work um, has continued. Um, out in the field, so the uh, in essence, the uh, fiber uh, runs from this building out um, and every uh, so many kilometers, they, they basically splice the uh, distribution fiber into the backbone fiber. So um, we have uh, basically, I think it's a to stand dry, I think it's kind of where the cutoff is. So from here go to that area, um, that is um, basically um, fiber ready. Um, the uh, pop sites, um, racks, uh, UPS for here um, that were supposed to uh, ship in early January were delayed. Um, they've actually now arrived, so all of the equipment uh, um, required to basically run the network um, from uh, this location is now here um, and is being validated and tested. Um, so we still are on track to have uh, uh, activities um, uh, required to onboard customers uh, before the end of uh, this month. Um, 
and, uh, and then continuing on as we uh, continue to uh, move forward. The wireless project uh, continues to progress, um, not probably at the pace that uh, we had originally hoped, uh, uh, mainly due to long lead times um, in availability and some of our co-locations um, that uh, we have. Um, there's basically an exclusive third party uh, that can do the work. Um, so um, that third party um, is scheduled. Uh, we do have dates for installations, but uh, on some of these locations, it is uh, well into the spring before um, they're able to actually climb the towers and install the equipment. Um, we continue to kind of uh, work that angle so a little bit. So one of the towers we've been able to shave a week off their original install date. So it's been moved up a week and we continue to look for ways to basically try and move those along. Uh, the tower for here um, actually shipped on Friday. Uh, one of the last towers shipped on Friday or two of them actually shipped on Friday, one for this location and one for uh, the Eureka area. Um, so those uh, are scheduled to arrive uh, this week. It takes almost a week for them to come, um, but they are uh, in transit and the contractor is lined up actually to start here next Monday um, for the uh, uh, construction of the tower that will go here. Um, I think uh, a lot of the other highlights, like uh, a lot of the work that's being done is really at this point around getting everything operational at this point. Um, so um, the data center here, um, the equipment, as I mentioned, is being validated and tested. Um, we are developing um, the other side of that uh, is the ISPs um, that will operate on the network. So um, the TPIA agreements, uh, which is basically um, the agreement by which they will operate on the network. So there are drafts of those out to um, five, I think it is at this point, ISPs to operate on the network. Um, and so that uh, will, uh, those will be finalized over the next uh, several weeks. So when we're uh, in a position to start onboarding customers, we will have um, a number of uh, potential product offerings or the residents will have a number of product offerings. Um, orders for uh, future fiber materials uh, are uh, uh, in process because uh, supply chain is a major issue um, with this project and uh, all other uh, uh, projects. And so uh, uh, we've seen that in some of the uh, orders that we have placed uh, to date. Um, delivery dates are uh, not being met uh, with a number of the items. So we're also looking at digital equity is looking at ways to tighten that up um, and uh, uh, to ensure that suppliers actually uh, meet their uh, targets. So looking at the um, kind of some of the other things that are uh, in progress. Um, the upstairs here continues to move along. Um, the electrical, uh, a lot of the electrical work, um, this report was as of the end of February, so a lot of the electrical work and uh, uh, work in the rooms has progressed over the last couple of weeks. So we've done kind of a, a real push put on. Um, there, um, 
in the uh, system. There's a uh, sprinkler system, um, new sprinkler system to be installed uh, in the room. So uh, there is a sprinkler system currently there, uh, but it is a wet sprinkler system um, with the equipment that's in the room to be basically turned to a, a dry chemical um, system. Uh, so that's uh, in the works now. Uh, we're looking to finalize uh, agreements for the various pop locations that we have. Uh, so uh, Town Hall uh, in Glasgow, there's one in Central West River as well. Uh, looking to uh, work that. Um, the service providers, as I mentioned, uh, those uh, uh, agreements are in draft form and there's ongoing discussions with uh, a number of service providers uh, who did actually be on the network um, and uh, <laughs> our home installations um, work uh, continues to continue to uh, kind of refine uh, what that process will look like um, as well communications uh, over the next uh, uh, Few weeks uh, there will be a, a ramp up on the communications, um, and uh, especially in the immediate uh, service area. So there will be uh, a number of initiatives done there. Um, over in the month of February, we did run radio edits, um, and we seem to uh, the interest has been generated from those has been. Uh, I would say significant um, because there's certainly a, a significant uptake on uh, communications from residents um, to us about uh, service uh, availability. So um, there is a, a plan uh, communications is uh, being developed now on the actual rollout um, of the uh, um, project and uh, how people will be able to uh, join the service uh, as we move to um, operations mode. Um, just on the make readies uh, for 2022, um, there is an update um, based uh, on feedback that came back from uh, council at the last meeting. Um, Particular, I guess, what would be in District 7. There's now uh, to make written set and file for that that can be accelerated. Um, so, what the team is doing, they're looking at vegetation maps um, and things like that, and where they can make significant progress uh, or, or minimize kind of the make ready process to some degree and speed things up. Um, um, we're doing that. Um, to basically uh, get more power on the poles and assets um, type thing. Um, and I think uh, those are probably the key highlights of the report. Um, from a budget standpoint, we're still uh, uh, on track, I guess, from a budget standpoint, uh, not foreseeing or not foreseeing any. Uh, uh, major issues in, in meeting uh, budgets. So. Okay, thank you, Brian. Now, uh, Morgan Parker. Thank you, Madam Chair. I don't know if I see how can answer this uh, question or put it to a going camera. If so, we can leave it. But um, it, it's mentioned here in the first paragraph of uh, Trouble with their prime contractor and uh, yeah, holding up progress here, which was unfortunate for a quick period of time in January because the uh, people weren't getting paid. Most people will keep working once they're not getting paid anymore. Um, and I'm wondering, uh, I know some correspondence taking place, but I didn't see any trucks around last week anywhere. Uh, and I'm just wondering, uh, is, is that process? Over of uh, uh, the trucks being held up, or the home from rent or there didn't seem to be any, anybody around in the area where they're 
working it that I could see anyway. And I'm just wondering, is that the holdup current contract is still a problem? Um, I would say yes, but I can provide more details if we want to be. Okay, no, but that's uh, uh, generally there is there are issues. Uh, Telecom are going to be back doing more specific work for us, um, apart from were they here last week? The contractor that I don't know. I was yeah, here last week. Here, uh, I, I... Okay, yeah, so. Uh, no, they weren't here. Last I week. didn't see them at all. And that's that's disappointing because we're people that are anxious to get this going and anxious to get it working, and uh, it just seems we're being held up for uh, a similar question on the, the second paragraph. It says a tight follow through is maintained for a continuous tree trimming and make ready process to no the final on weekly calls. Is that happening, or is 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 tree trimming and stuff taking place now, or? Um, there is some continuing because they are working on make ready 70 and make ready 68. Um, they are continuing to work on those two. Um, okay, I just haven't seen anybody um, about that. So, yeah, depending on which direction they're in, I know a week and a half ago they were back in the Abercrombie area uh, on the Abercrombie Grand yeah. Road, which I think is part of 60. Eight. So that we're back there. Um, so those calls do happen and on a weekly or basis, and the project team meets with no switch power. They get uh, the weekly updates on uh, what has happened, and uh, our priorities are conveyed to them that you should be focusing in this area. So that's the most critical area that we would cooperate with. So. But as we move into 2022, we have to get that done if we're going to be able to, you know, wires and the poles in these other areas. Okay, my final question, Madam Chair, is um, in terms of hiring uh, a person to uh, manage this uh, process or this uh, operation, uh, have we, where are we at on that? Have the, have the uh, Oh, the names come in, or have we done any interviews? Um, so we just closed on Friday. Closed on Friday. So, yeah, so, we'll the, yeah, so they'll be shortlisted hopefully this week, and then we'll move forward from there. So, there, I think there was nine, nine applications that we received. So, okay, good. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, Councilor Randy Palmer. Thank you, Madam Chair. And my question, same as the warden's, uh, it's just reading here that said uh, there's still important concerns about the film's financial stability. Are they not? Are we paying them? And they're not encouraging their subcontract? That would be a good characterization. Yeah. So, so, when we give them a progress payment, do we only need an example? Is that exactly what you say? That's what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Uh, has anybody talked to them about this or should, can we talk about this? Then that's yeah. probably pushing the line of income or something. Yeah. Okay. I, I think that maybe we should probably go in camera just to. Yeah, to everybody. Just to be here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the other. I, I know it's the posting there. Was there, we only post for one position or we post for two? Or? So initially one, um, and then there would be support. So yeah, come back. Come yeah. after, right? One person or more? Uh, one to start and yeah, potentially two. more. Yeah. And the third and last thing I want to do we hear back from the province of the level of the sentence? No, we did not. We did not. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Palmer. Deputy Warden Wayne Murray. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just got asked this question public because I think I know the answer, but the people that we've signed up for testing have been asked for when we're going to get into the Are they still going to be ahead of the before it was on? 
Um, so some of them are wireless service, but then can some are fiber. So um, fiber ones, I guess, is what. Yeah, yeah. So the fiber ones are probably going to be first. Um, so they will uh, contact them uh, to arrange for the drops and. And so, so they will be first before us out to the general public. The it, 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 yeah, yeah. It, it probably um, just okay. based on the way the project and the home drops are going to occur. It could be just matters of days, right? And then it, it's going to be in set up that these first 200 homes, anybody that kind of signs up, it, the report kind of references piloting to some degree um, in a way we're somewhat fortunate that the area is somewhat defined so we can work out the bugs, right? Because as we continue, once we get beyond this first phase, it's just going to be continuous. So the plan is to kind of work out all the, figure out all the, when we do an install, make sure that it's a seamless thing from start to finish type thing. So, so the next question is what I'm getting is the ones that we submit the names for. We call them they have free the first month for testing. Is that still the one that we'll start getting? It, it, it's probably, uh, there's probably going to be a period there of, uh, where it is free um, simply because we're, we're going to be operational and um, the ISPs may lay a week to two weeks behind, right? Because they, they've got to kind of set up their operations as well. Um, taking, so there is probably going to be a period where people can test it and then we can also see the network works, right? And we will understand uh, traffic patterns, data patterns, what data stays in the province, what data goes out of the province, um, I think, um, because it's all if it stays in the province, you really don't pay for it because it's it's just circulating in equipment in Nova Scotia. But if somebody attaches the Google, well, Google's not in Nova Scotia, so there's data that would be tracked, right? So it gives us that ability to kind of fine tune our business and understand it. So just thank you for that answer. And I apologize for asking the public, but I had to because the pressure was on and people. Yep, thank you. Okay, thank you, Deputy Warren. Uh, Councillor Debbie Wadden. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Brian, just under contracts there on the first page, the last one, the 2022 Enterprise Operations Partnership, customers with large liabilities. Would you explain to me what that is? Sure. So, um, Basic infrastructure or basic agreements um, that you have with your customers. Um, so when we do um, a residential home, or when the ISP does a residential home, they're, they're called service level objectives. So the, the ISP says we will provide you with 150 megabit service or up to 150 megabit service. They're actually in most residential customers that have any of the providers. That's the way it works. So you may, like personally, I have 1.5 gig service on the speed test. I might be getting 200. So you're not obligated to actually provide what you're um, saying you're going to provide, right? But on the enterprise side, that's where, say, a large or a business says, I need one gigabit of data, right? So what this is, is looking for um, kind of on the operation side, and there's that becomes what they call an SLA, which is a service level agreement. Um, so you have to provide them that one gig service or 150 service or whatever it is. Um, so it's it's looking for uh, um, kind of that partner that will ensure that we're able to meet that um, type thing. And they would uh, kind of take on the, 
uh, um, some of the operations side, right, to ensure that we're actually meeting those targets. I would be providing that. I could agree to that. Thing. Or to be some rep numbers on that. Uh, there are companies that there could be somebody like a telecom, uh, Plexus, um, somebody like that that, that can uh, do it. Um, I don't think early on we're going to have that uh, requirement just based on the way the network's being built. It's probably uh, most of ours are probably going to be SLOs with just objectives. There's probably not going to be uh, at this point a, a large enterprise part of it. And, and the overall business plan we only had, I think it was like five percent of the total business plan it was in that. So, um, but that's really what it is, it's finding somebody to help us manage and ensure that if we say to company X, we'll be able to give it that the network actually is fully operational to do that, right? And they look after the circuits and all the programming and stuff being like that. So that's really what it's intended to be. Okay, thank you, I appreciate that. And just, uh, yeah, but just like a goal and record that I would appreciate it in the camera session if some things we should be discussing, especially with a lot of people. All right, thank you, uh, Councilor Wyden. Any other questions or comments on the broadband uh, internet project this evening? Go ahead, Councilor Andy Thompson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, under working market conditions, partnership with Telesat has been turned up, but we're only in that in 2025. What is that? So that's basically um, a satellite, potential satellite. Service um, to help in build, um, but they're the, they're a Canadian-based satellite provider, um, but they're several years away from operation wise I believe. And there's been architectural discussions between Starlink Premium and the teams to evaluate where technologies coexist. Is that uh, so? Similar to Telsat, it's where can uh, satellite services help us, right? Like yeah. filling gaps, uh, um, help provide, um, you know, even transport between towers, like uh, rather than looking at potential microwave lanes because it doesn't um, work, you can also look at uh, satellite lanes. So you're basically being, being down and up uh, to take the link your towers through satellite service. And I'm curious, I don't know if you have, I don't know, I don't understand very much myself, but there, there's a CRTC process going on right now to hand out a new round of 5G spectrum and all the major telecoms are involved in this. How will that impact this? So that's 5G is cellular. Um, I've had that discussion this morning with the project manager because I asked that question. Um, so 5G is just a new way of providing cellular. Um, so it's different equipment, different power emanations, things like that. So it's it's really on the cell side, the 5G. So because I, I heard this on a list of podcasts and some of the advertisements on for support this 5G application sort of thing. And the way they were selling these ads was that it's next next uh, uh, phase of the internet. It's, there is some data transport right through your cell phones and mobility, right? Uh, everybody has one of these and um, but it, it's really just the it's a new frequency range that has different equipment and hardware and uh, things associated with it. It's the way it was explained. Okay. And my last question is like there's been a lot of delays in, in getting this thing up and running and people will be going on the website and punching in their civic address and trying to get an expected date. Uh, are those dates accurate on the website now? Uh, some of them probably still are and uh, in the uh, report it does say uh, there's an update coming for that to 
um, update some of them because some of those targets, you know, especially on the wireless side, I think we had March in there. Um, some of them will be pushed out in a couple of months. So that, that update is coming. So I guess my next last question is um, I was at a, a fire department meeting in Springville last week, and everybody's asking me, when are we going to get like from Sunny Gray down to Forbes Lake? When are they going to get? When are they going to get serves? They're looking, they're waiting for the serves. So the yeah, so the Eureka Tower, which will probably service that area, is scheduled to commence in April. So when the, that gets built, is that a, how much of a construction timeline? Is that a couple more months after April? No, no. Like you know, start to finish, like a tower is um, the one here is about three weeks um, from start to finish. So, um, so that, depending on the equipment that needs to go on it, like this one here. Is actually going to take about four to five weeks, but there's an optional equipment that's going to be put here um, that won't be on all towers. So the, the, the primary function of this tower here, they start uh, next Monday. Within three weeks, that tower is basically operational. Um, and then here, there's going to be some additional equipment put on just because this is kind of like a Central hub type thing for a few of the other towers, but they three weeks from start to finish. So, was the Eureka Tower is that replacing the one that was going up the River Road, or is the River Road one going to be that's it? Well? That's it. It's that the is, center of the road. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Churchville. Churchville. Church the Eureka, the Eureka. Square Yeah. Okay. Good enough. All right. Thank you, Councilor Thompson. Any other questions or comments? Okay, hearing none, um, we'll move on to number seven. We have reports this evening. The first report in our package was the recreation report uh, from the recreation department, and this report was for the month of February 2022. What is your pleasure, councillors? Moved by Councillor Palmer, seconded by Councillor Elliott. Any questions or comments on the recreation report? Board of Partners. Thank you, Madam Chair. Now, I lost my place here because I was on the high seat internet. <laughs> I, guess, uh, I had a couple of questions under this, and it both had to do with the, uh, had to do with the school system. So, I suppose uh, okay, number the goal one, active living and, and well being. Does the active smart kids, school kids, have arrived and will be making their way into the school? So, encourage physical activity during the school day. Kids include everything the classroom teacher will need to make movement in lessons easy and seamless. West Victor Consolidated has enlisted to be part of this great program. We look forward to working with them. Can anybody give me any idea what great idea to have kids and everything in the classroom? But I'm just not sure what that uh, entails when I read that, you know, that it would be happening in those classrooms. It's going to be, it's going to make the kids more active. Do you have anybody online anywhere that can help? I'll be here. Sorry. Uh, I can't give you any direct information online. Okay. Uh, I would have to ask early on during COVID when, when we had permission to be in the schools. Um, but I certainly will have Claire uh, reach out to you as an explanation. Okay, I urge all counselors maybe it's just be good to know, no. you know what it is that it's a great idea, the more active you can keep when it's kids or elderly or whatever, it's just, you've identified activity or movement <laughs> as being important. Um, so the other one also had to do with schools and it was under Goal four, the community use of schools committee 
met this month to discuss the issues that community groups are currently facing in terms of access to community facilities. There is currently a need for uniform messaging when it comes to access to Pitt County schools. This committee is working together to make sure that as many community groups have access to schools as possible. Back in my former career a year ago at the school board, we're not, that was a big issue. Uh, you know, whether schools are part of the community, whether those facilities should at least be uh, available for use when the school is not using them, and uh, I just thought maybe this is an outcome of the goal with the uh, yeah, or is it really something more than that? I think the reason why you felt that a settlement is because access to the school in the past couple of years just hasn't been there, uh, but now that um, we're looking forward to having more access with the lifting of the state of emergency uh, and um, external groups being committed into the schools, we're finding that there's not consistency uh, from one school to the next on the access and a lot varies to the principal. So we're just trying to um, have an even playing field regardless of where the school is. Okay, uh, and is is there a directive, you know, from the uh, school board in more with better grades gauge or whatever, as to what that should be? Or I believe there is something, but uh, there seems to be issues with it being forced consistently uh, throughout the system. So uh, those are the discussions that are happening right now. Okay, I guess we'll be updated on what the outcome of those discussions are because schools are an important part for a lot of communities. Uh, you know, I'm thinking of Scottsburg and Salisbury, the school and different ones that those facilities, uh, as much as the school likes to think those are ours and, you know, we don't walk in here sometimes, it, it's, uh, there has to be a balance both ways. It has to take care of and everything, but uh, it's a shame to see those not available for community use. Uh, within reason, anyway. So that's why I brought it up tonight because I read it there and I thought, well, that sounds like something from back in the 90s almost to be discussed. Okay. Um, it's always a challenge, but um, the recreation coordinators are working on, are working on a solution. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Board Member. Uh, Councilor Chester Dillon. Thank you, Chair. Uh, back in 2003, in 2004, when we built the new schools, that was part of the deal. I think there's a problem with the administration for this side of it because that's why we gave $480,000 over 10 years for the presentation centers to help the communities to have these things. And there's got to be paperwork for it somewhere. And I'm sure that Ms. McLean or somebody that was in the know, and somebody else would know that. And we might be in the tube somewhere, but anyway. Uh, Things are different everywhere now, and they forget about things in the past, right? But that was, they, they were agreeable to anything when they came to the old council hall that night when we said yes or no to the mind, right? And that was some of the fine print at that time. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Hewer. Any other questions or comments? If you hear none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Contrary minded nay. Motion carried. Next, we have the communications report for uh, the month of um, February. And as you notice, there is some new information in there that uh, we had in the report this evening that we um, were able to obtain. So, Sue Ann, want to add anything? Or? Who is following us? Um, so Facebook has kind of changed up the way they've done things now, and they let us know who's following us, and then this was included in the last month's report as well. Um, but it's good information for us to have. We get an idea of who's looking at our pages and, and the percentage numbers, and if they're increasing or decreasing along the line, and so far I think it's looking good. So. Um, just before I turn off my mic, I will say, um, in regards to the internet project, I 
of the my services uh, David Council Director was the first counselor to come forward with a great payers information for me. And I suggested that I could attend his council meeting and answer any questions that I have. Um, they will have some material by then to distribute as well. I'll try to get the most up to date information that I have available to me. So if anybody else wants that service as well, let me know. It doesn't have to be a formal presentation, I can just answer questions. If there are questions from the audience, or we can talk about it. So let so, me you know the services are there. Okay, thank you very much, Joanne. Any other questions or comments? Board Cracker. Thank you, Madam Chair. I know it was 75% of her call order went uh, three, three to one when the men. Is that, uh, you know, traditional or whatever I want to call it for, uh, you know, other uh, bodies, or is that any different for us than it is for anybody else? I don't really know if it's a member us specifically. I know my house is probably, I think my son and my daughter, my daughter's on a 90% board with my son, is, so I don't know if women. Enjoy it this before or lack of? Yeah, okay. I, was just, I was surprised, I guess, when I read that, that it wasn't somewhat more balanced, and I was wondering if it was you know, in particular about the you know, government and in particular municipal government, uh, yeah, or if it was just almost at the law. Facebook gives you these numbers, but they don't. Oh, they change that. Thank you. Hearing no other questions or comments. I need a motion for this. Is a move or a second? Okay, move by Councillor Butler. Second by Deputy Warden Murray. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Country minded nay. Motion carried. Next, we have the accounts paid for the month of February. Motion to move those. I'll move it. Okay, Councillor Turner, seconded by um, Councillor Parker. Councillor Parker, you had a question. Three actually. Uh, check number uh, 18273. Uh, all three there in a row, but roll that visa. I just don't know what's for. Can't make up the code. HRCN slash CNCRVC. So that's the right column. And then all in the same check. January 2022 internet DE. And a much smaller one. There's be some cotton when they're paid by Carol. I'm guessing. So the first one, I believe, is a conference that uh, attended. You know, I think it's your you were attending along with the Council of Owens. Okay. So that was Charles Dumont. He's a well, no, it doesn't have anything to do with the Smart Energy Conference that I can see. Um, yeah, it's who would actually build this. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and what's the next one? Is another similar amount. Internet. Oh, that's uh, supplies that were purchased uh, for the uh, internet project. Okay. Yeah, so the, the last is just miscellaneous purchases, including uh, uh, coffee for and the Zoom platform. Uh, I'm, just put, I'm just putting on the screen. Yeah. Oh, I'm down the same page, 18301, uh, declared for postage. How do we get in arrears to can the post? Uh, so not arrears we can't the post it's for our rear bills. Okay. It's for our rear's bills. Yeah, tax bill. Yeah. Okay, that is clear. And finally, uh, on the next page, I believe 18323. Uh, can't accept it. Uh, there's two big ones there. Is, is this do we have breakdowns or is this a standard type of uh, pump and clean or what is it? $125,000 total. That would that be a question for Logan? Yeah, hello. Uh, I think um, I'm just having trouble finding uh, that exact check. What was the what was the total amount? 
Councilor Carter? Love, love it is for line of seat. Oh, for line of seat. Yeah, we we had a pump I down. No uh, okay, thank I'm you. Yeah, no, seat. we had. Yeah, thanks. We had we had pumps down in line of seat. Uh, we were down to one pump in a particular lift station, uh, so it resulted in um, significant pumping uh, during one of the big rain events um, over a long period of time. Uh, we've since had that pump repaired, and we're looking at all of our. We're implementing a starting to implement a new program to review all of our lift stations, so we can determine in, and uh, sort of. Um, repair those that have only one pump on the go to, uh, to avoid this issue in the future. But the issue there was that normally lift stations have two pumps. Um, this particular lift station only had one pump uh, that was working. That pump failed and we had significant pumping over that period of time. It was a number of days uh, that we had to we had to pump regularly and hillside as well uh, related to those uh, significant rainfall events and I know in our subsequent meeting here this evening we're going to speak about that a little bit more but um, same idea we had to have significant pumping so we don't expect these to be regular bills uh, going forward but it is going to be part of our program uh, to start looking at those lift stations that have single pumps uh, because we really should have that redundancy uh, of the second pumps does that answer your question yes thank you we certainly have to be careful because there's always a lot of crap falling falling through the lines here in Hillside, right? Council Boyles? <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you, Councilor Carter. Any other questions or comments concerning um, the accounts table? Councilor Dewar. Thank you. Uh, did we change our janitorial people? We did. Okay, I just I used to say I'm a brain with the new name. Yeah, no, we did in January. Okay. Switch conference. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor signify saying, oh, sorry. Sorry, I just noticed a remat on the electronic payments for English remat. Uh, remat. <clears throat> remat would be uh, towers. So that's. Uh, Supplier of towers. Sorry, Councilor Wong, I didn't see that. <laughs> okay, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Crunch your mind at nay. Motion carried. All right, so next we're going to move on to number eight. We have uh, three municipal um, policies uh, to discuss this evening. The first one is the repeal of proof of vaccination policy, policy number 20211156. Um, this one, and I believe the next one we'll be discussing, uh, have to do with the uh, state of emergency being lifted in Nova Scotia as of today. So, Brian, I'll turn that over to you with the repeal. Yeah, it's, it's really uh, just a policy that uh, one of our other policies that we had, we had put a sunset clause in that linked it to the state of emergency when that one was passed. It didn't do that, so the policy was now. At this point. So what we're looking for tonight is a motion to take this to council for um, repeal. repeal. Okay. Um, okay. It's been moved by Councillor Thompson and seconded by Council Bonner. Um, Councillor Dave Parker. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Did we have any employees who were uh, on leave, we'll say, because of our vaccination policy? No. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, hearing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Country mind it nay. Motion carried. And next is something similar. Uh, as you're all aware, we've been on the phone and been on the uh, Microsoft Teams much over this past few years. And the state of emergency allowed for the video conferencing and teleconferencing calls. Um, but uh, within normal times, um, the MGA has, uh, states um, that we have about gathering um, for, for meetings and such. So, Brian, I'll turn that over to you as well. Sure. Um, so, this policy is just, um, it does allow council members to join 
electronically. Um, the policy is based on the premise that you are in chamber, so and that it's more of an exception to the rule than the rule. So if somebody uh, is traveling and going to be away, they can make a request to uh, the joint meeting electronically. Um, it really there are specific requirements in the act that if council was to say we're going to meet virtually, you actually have to give notice to the public. Um, and uh, the notice, as you'll see in section five, is in a publication in the newspaper circulating in your municipality. Uh, that's difficult to actually plan because we have a weekly. Um, so we would have to have significant advance warning that we're going to do an all electronic meeting to, in order to actually um, make it work. Um, and conversely, um, we're kind of running through scenarios if we had a flood of requests come in because it's going to be weather, bad weather or something, um, you still require the quorum in the chambers um, type thing. So it, it, the policy is really about exceptions. Um, Thing um, and it, it does limit it uh, to basically twice per year uh, that a cancer can um, use the exemption or uh, kind of set it up. So. Okay, thank you, Warden Harper. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just concerned with that last one because I know why it's there. I think more than twice, you know. Uh, Somebody that lady can just stay home all the time. They I don't need to go in there. Um, I'm not accusing anybody, but uh, the uh, let's say one of us got you know quite sick, but or you know disabled, you know we like ski and broke or late or whatever. But uh, you know, and you need more time than twice, twice more than what the meetings of all of us may do. Uh, I'm just not sure. You know, if I was laid out for four or five months, I could attend meetings virtually. Uh, why that wouldn't happen, or or game maybe would we'll see you know, saying the exceptions could be made, or or is that the hard and fast where you made your choice? That's it. It's kind of great that I say hard and fast. <laughs> and two was kind of the number that came through the model policy. Um, from the uh, AMA and uh, uh, NSF and uh, I guess the, the model, the more AMA, I guess. Um, does it have to be two? Could it be or three? Or you have it something like unless permission granted by council or whatever, if we know that one of our members was uh, not able to attend for whatever reason, other than virtually that we could uh, grant exemption. You know, like that was something or so that we would be too. It would be more medical too. I think there'd be a medical exception. Exemption. Yeah, for, be. for a good reason. Yeah. Not just because, like I said, uh, I feel like it. Say, oh. The other one I didn't quite understand. Try and mention that the end there. It was because it was a bad storm. Uh, you know, we, we can't have a virtual meeting even though we could. Um, knowing some of the weather during the bad storm, maybe it wouldn't be worth it. Yeah. It, it, it really, the, because this is meant to be the exception to the rule, if you had something come up and you say, well, we're going to move it to completely online, technically it's offside with the provisions of the Act. Now, the Act also does have the disclaimers in it that says no meeting is invalid for lack of notice, right? So right. if there was a good reason for doing that, you can always rely back on the Act that says, we had to do it for this reason, take that so. Okay, now I have more concern with the one that if somebody, you know, we're not able to be here for more than two months, as long as we can make an exception somehow, based on the reasoning, whether it be medical or whatever. Okay, thank you, Mr. Morton. Anyone else? So I guess we need, oh, sorry, Councilor Turner. Okay, I guess. <clears throat> My question is regarding the notwithstanding clause where the ward determines that there's an emergency. Is it at the sole discretion of the ward 
because it says here a meeting may be conducted by video conference without the notice or such notice as possible in the circumstances. So that, that is it at the sole discretion of the warden and is and what what determines an emergency, I guess is my question. Um it is really it is at the sole discretion. It's no different than um the way the act is worded presently if the warden determines there is something that needs counsel to meet in person then um, he has uh, the right to call the meeting um, a snowstorm be considered an emergency and that might be the way it would work but like a, a meeting like tonight the warden is not the chair uh, so it's difficult for the warden to call the meeting of a committee because it's not the chair, he is the chair of um, council. So uh, it's, it's it's one of those things, I think you put the framework in and then as you work through it, there might be like, was this really thought off? Or like we tried to, from an internal standpoint, we tried to think of the kind of the ways we would look at this type thing. Um, and try to think through some different scenarios and the, the one where you had to change from or you had a, a large number of people say I want to be virtually well if you don't have a quorum in the council chambers you don't technically have a meeting under this policy. Yeah, sure. Yes, but it was not a section section 4B of the draft policy says that the policy applies to committees established by council. So I would think that in the committee situation, the chair. Would be the chair, you know, making the determination that it is an emergency. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So for example, for tonight, if there was an emergency that this committee had to meet for a financial matter, then this chair would make that determination that we need virtual. Okay. Go back to the question I had before, and, and, and we make changes to this, or does something change the problems that says we got to It's a model. Um, so if there was uh, um, a willingness or to add a uh, an exception clause, and that could be uh, potentially looked at. Yeah, like the two. So if you just put something in there about, uh, you know, unless approved by council or something, otherwise, you know, so that if there was extenuated circumstances, council could grant the, uh, you know, uh, that that council right to attend more than two because of circumstances. Right now, if it's not fair to two, you can't do that. No, you can change, as Carolyn mentioned, like you can change that. I don't know about no. the two being the regular, you know, that you shouldn't allow it to be overused, but I would like to see us put something in there, you know, what you say, certain circumstances, if approved by council. If that's the committee's wish, we can fix that. I think so. I mean, we all, life happens sometimes, yeah, right? Yeah. Whether you're caring for, whether you're a caretaker of somebody who is ill or the list can be endless. Um, we all have, unfortunately, you know, besides counselors, we're also family members as well. So. These rules are for council. That's that. Correct. Yeah. Don't you need preference? I don't know. I um, I just caution on that last point. I, I recall here six years ago, that range, the uh, late David Master had missing a substantial amount of time. And we kind of some slack. Uh, but that, I mean, we didn't enforce the rule. Okay, because we knew he was sick. Uh, and it almost got into a problem. But that, I mean, we almost had a district who was going to vote in a referendum. That district was not going to have a voice carry that vote for council. So this needs to be real careful. 
but we don't say, well, it's also sick, it's better than cancer or whatever. Not really available for two, three, four, five months. Um, you know, yes, you want to be done. You want to do faster. That one almost come back and bite us. One of the bad people from the two three is saying, hey, my voice was hurt. Um, Tragically, they passed away, and we were able to get a new country elected uh, just in the nick of time. But their voice was carried for, but they came back close to bite us. So we have to be careful. Yes, we want to be generous, we want to be compassionate. We can't bend the rules so far that we serve ourselves outside. Thank you. Just to clarify, though, we're not saying about missing meetings, we're saying about joining virtually, right? So it's not about missing meetings, they still will be joining virtually. That's the okay. Yeah. Okay. Councilor one. Yeah, that's my, that's my concern with that colleague. And second to that, um, I think we should be in, not encouraging video um, conferencing, but maybe not limit us to about two meetings because when, when I look at the, for example, the winter months, this is something that more productive is because it's longer. And I think when we look at the winter months, you can have some very bad icy nights for driving down here. We live in distance from this council chamber. So I would like to be able to choose the meetings because I think it gives us an opportunity if the roads aren't safe to travel on to do it through uh, video conferencing. I think if that's an option I want to keep open for us. Absolutely, Mary, I'm traveling from all the different parts of the county. Go ahead, Councilor Boyles. One of the concerns there would be. Uh... Yeah, it's in the winter time, and then you say, okay, we're going to have a virtual meeting. And uh, so my time is early. I don't, I don't have, and, and, and phone, you know, I'm not getting through with it. So I'm missing a meeting. A lot of people could be missing meetings because they're, you know, I mean, so how would we, how would we work that? I mean, maybe there's something that's coming out the council that's very important to that community or that counselor that uh, just wasn't need to be heard. If they, don't have the, uh, they don't have the, uh, that, does that happen? It happened on, a, on a, one of the committee meetings there, I think, with the, uh, with the uh, uh, accessibility, uh, you know, and, and uh, I had it all walked up, but I was in Toronto, I couldn't through it all. I just sounded like it, just everything that burned, burned, burned. I think there was two, three, or four of us that night had the same problems. That's just the only concern to me there. Yes, and unfortunately, with technology, those one-off nights are going to happen. For sure, I understand what you're saying, for sure. So, I guess, are we looking to make that amendment to policy? Is that what our discussion has led us to this evening? So, oh, the two, but... We need a motion, then, Chair? Well, we have a motion on the floor already. Or an amendment to the motion. Okay. Oh, we don't. Okay, no, we don't, sorry. Okay, I, I would like to move that we adopt this policy, but uh, to put the leeway in there to have uh, more than two uh, if it's approved by council. Okay. I'll second that. Okay, I'm second by uh, Councilor Palmer here. Any more discussion on policy with those changes? Yes, Councilor Martin. Just want to clarify what are we saying that? For example, if, if there's seven meeting council chambers here and we found the rules for that, would we have to get full council permission to do it through video conferencing? How would that work? Just yeah, so the the premise of this is that if a councilor wants to join, they make the request to to me and I approve it. I think what the warden is saying is that if it's a circumstance that would go beyond what would be traditional, that council would. So I think there's two different issues. It's to the right number for normal circumstances, and then the special circumstance. I think that it probably are two different issues. So whether two is an appropriate number because you meet well, from November to March, right? You're meeting twice a month, and this also applies to all your subcommittees as well. Um, so is two the right number? I guess. Okay, well, let's talk with the first issue that is to the right number, and then we'll get to the second issue. So, does anyone want to speak to the number? Councilor 
of like if I already said, I think it has to be more than two. I don't want to make it so that people can stay home and not attend meetings. I don't mean that way either, but I think when you have to put something there, when the conditions or something like that, I think we should definitely be looking more than two. So would you like, would you be looking to name them specifically for reasons too, or just leave it open? Sure, Brian, do you know what other, I know a lot of other community or other municipalities passing this policy, so I haven't looked to see. Yeah, some, a lot of them are probably adopting the model, which is two, but I mean, it could be all over the board. We haven't really looked at survey that way, yeah. but the model suggested uh, two, so. Could we have it do the sessions, like two meetings, um, but the bad weather doesn't count towards it or something like that? Is that an except? Could you have an exception in it like that? What's bad weather? Yeah, go ahead, Ken. Just on bad weather, we're going to cancel the meeting, no matter how far you're coming from. So, you know, it's just, uh, I know at work, the snow, snow days, things like that. Once you see a few drops of snow, people are saying, oh, I'm not coming to work, blah, blah, blah. So, I think it has to be canceled through, through, yeah. uh, the, capital, through the CAO or the warden, whoever's here at meeting. Okay, thank you, Councillor Palmer. Uh, Deputy Warden Murray. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I think too that two is the number, but under certain circumstances, road or something bad, like drawing from the end the go ahead for you one drop as well, right? Is that what I'm hearing? Prior to the meeting or not? The words can be that, right? Yeah, I guess the chair, it, it, the premise or is that. You're supposed to give notice to the public if you're doing an electronic meeting, and if so, yeah, I realize that, but I can't get it in here until it's Wednesday for that. If I don't know that until five o'clock, and I'm probably in the meeting will be online. Yes, so that wouldn't count as one of the two. No, that would count as one of your two. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Hi, right, Councillor Elliott. Thank you. I think that the two is the number. It depends on what you personally want to use them for. If you know you only have two, then you'll have to weigh it out and make your decision. Is the storm bad enough that you want to attend the meeting, or is the storm bad enough that you're going to stay home? Okay. Go ahead, Councillor Farmer. <clears throat> yeah, uh, I look at it differently than whether. Otherwise, because I think in the past, if the weather's don't be bad, we get called in the afternoon and cancel the meeting. So I don't think that the weather's an issue. I think it is if you're away on vacation. If I say if I went to court and we're having two or three meetings when I'm away, I take my iPad and I think it will be in that way, right? Correct. It's more of a vacation or if you want to attend the meeting, there's the option there for you. So I, I think two could be the number, and then if if uh, if you're away on those circumstances, then then can be approved by the CAO or the whatever we want to say, right? Yes. But you know, as far as just not showing up for certain reasons, I think it should be attended as much as possible, unless you get you're sick or flu or something like that, and you still want to attend, you can do it that way. But as far as weather was, I think we cancel anyway. So it's not a and I also think the counselors around the table as well. I mean, we could probably count on one hand, even the ones that have been here for a very long term, and how many meetings they've missed, right? So I really feel like it's a, a small issue overall because it's not something that any counselor regularly does in our chambers, is missed meetings. So go ahead, Councilor Murray. Or Debbie Warren Marine, my apologies. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, come back to you later. Okay, so the second part of that issue, do you want to remind us, me? You to talk about? So the second part of the issue is really what the warden. Sorry, uh, the second part is really what the warden was referencing, and that is 
a special circumstance where the person could be, uh, for whatever reason, uh, personal, compassionate, medical, they can still participate virtually, but physically couldn't be here. So the exemption be allowed for that. And it would have to be based. Council would have to approve. Well, the council would approve that. Yeah, go ahead, Karen. Under those circumstances, you would know relatively early on that the absence was going to be for more than two weeks. I think that gives council the opportunity to perhaps um, pass a motion suspending a certain section of the policy um, to allow that virtual absence to go on for a period of time. As long as we have it, it's not a period of time. Yes, go ahead, Morgan. As long as we know we have the ability to do that, if it's written in there that you know under uh, it's board approved or the uh, council approves that you know we can do uh, differently uh, for and, and I'm thinking mostly of people being laid up for, for a while or one of their family members getting straight out of care or something, you know that type of thing. Which sometimes you don't know that's going to be. When I was laid up here the other winter, I didn't know if it was going to be a month or three months. Uh, I would have said that it was two months already, but COVID was there and everything anyway, so it didn't make much difference. But uh, it's just that we have the allowance to know that that member is not going to be away. You have to be back in two months, you finish. He's not going to be laid up for another three. Uh, I, I, I would like to see it in there so we know that that's what uh, I do agree with Daryl that we, we do anything we want, suspending it, but it'd be nice if we did it. <laughs> Okay. So the motion was okay. Deputy Warden Murphy. Okay, you're wrong. <laughs> no, no. Uh, it, is, it is a policy and we, we can change it any time. So that's why we should I just go with the recommended number two. And if it does work out down the road, we can go ahead and change it. It's very simple. It might be one that we have to kind of live through to see how. You know, right. and we have to remember all policies are plenty of documents too. They're always open to change and review. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded. Are we ready for the vote, councillors? So we're voting on the draft as it is. With thank you, Mr. Warden. His motion was to add the exception okay. clause. Okay. With the exception clause. Okay. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Contraband nay. Motion carried. Okay, so there's the municipal policies. Um, we have the recreation grant policy updates as well. Um, this one here is also in your package. Go ahead, Brian. Uh, so this is just um, the the changes that are here are just adding consistency amongst all our grant. Policies um, um, is really what the intention uh, here was. Um, one of the changes that um, we had, we actually budgeted um, to increase the high cost funding programs from twenty dollars to twenty five um, in this fiscal year, and we had also budgeted to increase the uh, participant low cost funding programs from uh, $7 to $10. Um, one of the, uh, uh, I guess, new clauses that's in there is under the $25 uh, dollar, uh, participant amount is we put in a cap, uh, that the maximum grant allotment to any organization would be $8,000 fiscal year. Um, basically, the probably the impact to one community group, um, which is uh, probably um, hockey, um, but that program also has significant money sitting in reserve funds and things like that. So um, it was kind of, that was kind of the notion behind that, was just to put an upper limit on what we would give to the group. Um, and the $8,000 is well within the traditional amount that they would, that the program would receive. So 
Um, so that was kind of the thought behind that. Um, as I say, the other changes that are highlighted in it um, are in some way uh, just housekeeping. Um, and uh, one of the other changes that we've made is the district grants, the $150. We've just kind of made that consistent with the other policies that uh, the CAO or designate can, can approve those that's budgeted. So if it's submitted, um, it doesn't have to come to a meeting. Just streamlining uh, the process to make it a little more consistent. Um, so those are the changes, uh, the, the major changes, and we've added a section really on reporting and accountability, um, which was not in uh, the program before, but was in the other uh, recommended program. So. Okay, a little bit of large discussion. Council David Brown. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, case three that it talks about the uh, major community reparation capital uh, generally to assist the community facility in excess of ten thousand dollars. I'm going to use an example here. Community uh, decides it's time to replace the community hall. That like is a schoolhouse or rather. They're not worth putting a whole lot more money into it. They decide to fundraise for two or three years to uh, give them enough capital to build a new home. $400,000. Yeah, good estimate of what it might cost. Uh, and therefore, they could apply to the county for up to uh, 40% of that. That may be that's their tax benefit. That's still a lot of money. However, this is where I have the problem. Uh, the organization has not received funding in the previous three years. They might have got a small municipal services grant, might have got a grant through this program for, uh, I don't know, a Taekwondo project they want to start up. So for two or three, four hundred dollars, they could be disqualified for fund. Okay, I'm just wondering if we should. Uh, Put more meat on those bones. The organization has not received uh, funding in excess of ten thousand dollars in the previous three years. You know, yeah, the intent there that it may just require a little tweaking in the wording is that they haven't received funding for a major community recreation capital. So, yeah, that's the intent. That's not clear. Yeah, so if you could have a group saying, "Well, we'll apply for." 25 this year, 25 next year, 25 the year after, say that all up and count that as part of our contribution. Uh, it's different than saying five twice. Yeah, um, so it's really meant to be under that category. They haven't received funding under that category in the previous three years. It's really what the intent of that is. I would move that we add them to the Organization has not received funding under this category in the previous three years. Just so that it does, you don't get disqualified for a, a minor, you know, if the council said, well, okay, we'll help you out a little bit here. Give you a few hundred dollars in this service grant and then come back to fight that. Now you don't qualify. Let's just I'll second that motion. Okay, so it's been moved and seconded. Anyone else like to speak on the issue? Councilor, would you mind taking over for me as vice chair? Sure, go ahead. You're the vice chair. There's a few of them. Okay, yes. Okay. Um, if I could speak, so. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I think that it's really great that we give um our recreation grants to organizations. Um, you know, they they come here for the figure. Uh, County applicants or county um, participants within organizations. I would like to see that somehow passed on to the actual participants, though, that are part of um, the actual program. Um, preset from seven to ten dollars. All right. My misunderstanding here. That's your small percentage. 
I would just like to see that being passed on to the families that are participating in that instead of going into a big fund directly. I don't know if we can. Yeah, see, that's where you go outside of the act. You cannot grant money to individuals, so you have to supply it to the program that's uh, so corrupt club or whatever. You mm -hmm. can't give it to John Smith who's working on this black belt, but you can give it to the Victor Henry Karate Club, right? That if it's John Smith is a member off the hat, then he's a from the county president. So there's no way to actually somehow put that in there to uh, as a benefit mm -hmm. for county residents. It's, it, the, the benefit to the county residents is that we require proof of residency. So when they apply uh, for programs or Victor Henry Karate, such a club applies, they have to tell us that they have 20 people and we verify their addresses as being a county resident. So that's it's a simple math calculation. Yes, we verified 20 times 7 the, 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 the piece, right? So that, that's how we ensure that it, it does in theory benefit the county residents is yeah. that we do require them to validate it or I guess we validate that they actually are county residents. And I understand that and, and you know, it's just too bad that savings can't be passed on to the actual individual or to the individual uh, families. Okay, Mr. Chair, I think I know where uh, House is coming from is that, you know, in some cases it's no sort of organization doesn't seem to help local uh, players at all. Is, it, is there perhaps a case where money is going to a particular organization could go to a different organization and thereby find its way to the the uh, individuals more, or you know, I think he's probably back to hockey, and uh, you know, that's where a lot of the problems come. Is it's, I don't know a lot about hockey, but the money seems to disappear uh, into a big pot somewhere, and, and perhaps the feeling is that it's not going to benefit our, our kids that much, uh, you know. It, but it's, I realize it has to go to an organization, but is there a different uh, organization can go to them that we're going to now. It's a feeling that it's not getting to uh, local uh, players to help. There's a lot of parents can't afford the amount of money that it takes, and, and uh, the feeling, I guess, that maybe it's not uh, helping those people. It's going into that bigger pot. Yeah, I, I think that debate, right, we probably had about five years ago when they eliminated the various associations that used to be with each of the ranks, right? Because we used to provide the money directly to the District 13 hockey program or now we're going to try to pass the to the to pick the on your hockey, right? Um, and you will hope that the revenue that they're taking in somewhat reflects in what they're charging, right? Uh, but uh, hence, I think we'll also want to kind of look at on as well, like the China provide some checks and balances a little bit. But. I wasn't specifically just speaking about hockey, um, but that is an example. I, I think it's uh, I think it's every in order to participate in extracurricular activities now, it's um, a lot for families, um, even the uh, ones that you know aren't deemed the expensive ones. Especially, you know, turn into a food of the day was one days, let alone, you know, put your child for their sports, whatever it is, uh, or recreation activities. So, you know, I uh, I understand why it is the way it is. I just wish that maybe the organizations could be reflectful in the fact that the money is coming from the municipalities for uh, county residents' participation. Thank you. Anybody else? Dr. Warren Murray. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chair. Uh, can we put stipulations on that uh, when we send the chat that we'd like to see that money go towards offset registration of the county team? It's an after the fact thing. The registrations have already occurred. So we're subsidizing after the fact, right? They've already had the participants. So it's, 
the way this is structured, it would become very cumbersome, I think, and uh, it may not be a bad idea, but then you're putting probably an extra layer on volunteer. Some of these groups are volunteer based, so you create more administration on their side as well. It's probably not ideal, but it's Anybody else? Council one. If I could just say one thing, like I think I think at the end of the day, twenty-five dollars per county person is going to work ten for the for the low cost ones. I think the money is going towards running the organization as best it can. So I, I think I got more people than that really know because there's a lot of good programs out there that that we are supporting this way, and 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 our county kids are able to take part in those programs. Yes, that's it. Give it back to you now. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Councilor Dewar, appreciate that. All right, um, discussion. We've had a motion on the floor, we've had some discussion. Um, is there any other questions or comments? Questions from call? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Time to remind it nay. Motion carried. Okay, let's move on to number nine, charitable donation receipts. I believe both of these were put on by Councillor Thompson. Um, the first one is East River Valley Play Project. Uh, they're doing a project for the natural playground. Uh, the cost of the project is 131000 for the project. Um, so I'll turn the first one over to you, Councillor Thompson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the community um, out there in uh, the whole district is pretty excited about this. This project here, um, and a lot of it goes to um, there's great volunteer base. With this this uh, is located in Springville. Some would know it as the Springville Ball field, you know, but it's uh, more than sound like Canadian Tire. It's more than the ball field. Um, but uh, they uh, over the past ten or eleven years, dedicated group of volunteers out there have worked, raised money, um, did the sweat equity and all that stuff and fixed, fixed the property up. They, they added a, replaced the backstop on the ball field. Uh, they resurfaced the basketball court. Um, they added a walking track around the perimeter of the property. Um, they refinished the uh, public washroom on site. Um, they added a uh, concrete ramp and railings to the uh, recreation zone. Um, so over the past 10 years, in real dollars, there's been $75,000 invested into this park. And all of this work was done with the thought of um, installing a playground, a proper playground for, for the youth in the area, which there are a lot of youth in the area now. There's a lot of young families in the East River Valley. Um, and they come from everywhere to, to go and use the park. Summer recreation uses it. There's 50 kids there in the summer. Um, and they use the, the whole property for the recreation program up there. Um, Mr. Clark here tonight is talking about great grants. There, there's a lot of grants involved in, in getting this playground out, you know, um, we're confident we're going to receive some uh, assistance from both the federal and provincial government. Actually, we did receive a confirmation from the federal government for their portion of the project. Um, provincial government is reviewing the application now, and we have, uh, the committee has a uh, application to Council grant for for some unit, municipal funding, but there's also a component of the community. Um, earlier this year, there was a news article in their local paper, a profile of Mike Hekimovich, who's a key volunteer in that area, and uh, he talked about getting the playground, and it was unsolicited, but he he received some some donations without even asking for them, uh, because from former residents of Springville and area, um, they know how important this is. Um, so 
the whole purpose of of uh, the uh, charitable tax donation you see for this project is to capture some of that goodwill in the community and uh, fundraise the community portion of that project. So I'll make a motion that we uh, give the municipality the issue of uh, charitable tax donations to the uh, East River Valley Clay Project. Okay, we'll second it. Um, any questions or comments on that? Okay, hearing none, let's call for the vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Contrary, one and nay. Okay, motion carried. And next we have 9B, McDonald Rebecca Lodge, number 108, Capital Improvements. And Capital Improvements are two accessible washrooms, a solar heat pump, and new kitchen area. And the value of that project is $84,000. I'll turn it back over to you, Councillor Johnson. Again, this, this, uh, this is a uh... This lodge is located in Sunny Bray, and um, it's it's got a state old building there. It's an IOF hall, and it's used for a local 4-H club. Um, and during the Remembrance Day ceremonies, that's where they have the uh, reception. Um, it's the only hall in the area, and there's you know they're, they're in the in the talks of um, downsizing the number of churches in the area. So this this could be the only public place to hold a, a, um, a reception or, or any any type of community uh, thing in the area. And this is in a very rural and remote part of the district. Um, sign in the village is like 25 kilometers to Glasgow, so it's it's important that they make the necessary accessibility upgrades to the property. Um, and they very, uh, they're, they're looking at uh, doing some green energy with a solar heat pump. And uh, so I'll make that a motion that we uh, provide charitable tax donations to the McDonald Rebecca Lodge capital improvements. Okay, thank you. And uh, Councillor Dewar is going to second that. Uh, okay, go ahead, Karen. Uh, Councillor Thompson provided me with contract information on the vote. Yes. yes. Any questions or comments? Here, okay, go ahead, Councillor Boyles. I'm just wondering on the one there for the uh, Rebecca Wallace and that, are they going for branch to or just by? Yes, they have a grant uh, uh, with the uh, provincial government and they also have a requesting gas credits. Okay. Great. All right, I'll talk with the vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Country minded nay. The motion carried. Okay, let's move on to number 10, 2022-2023 Municipal Service Grant Transfer, $250,000 from General Operating Reserve to the General Operating Fund. So usually we've been waiting for our budget to pass and the last couple of years due to COVID, it's happened later. I think Councillor Palmer, you had brought this to our committee levels and council before about uh, the money's been almost there in our budget to move this forward so that we are able to hold our meetings in a timely manner. Therefore, organizations are able to complete their work in a timely manner and uh, before the snow flies, I guess, in the fall. And uh, so, um, this is what we will be discussing this evening. Okay, so it's been moved by Councillor Palmer. Do we have a seconder? Warden, uh, moved by, or seconded by Warden Mer or, <laughs> Warden Harper, sorry. Yeah. Um, it's contagious, yes. Uh, any questions or comments on uh, moving uh, the grant transfer? Councillor Dave Parker. I was saving this for April 2nd, but I do, I've been bringing that now for 50 years. Uh, that $250,000 amount, although certainly is appreciated, doesn't go near as far as it used to. And uh, maybe on Saturday, if you it this year, we think this will go live with it. But I think it should go to 300 350 over the next two years. Uh, if you don't believe me, go up the price just to look at it, including higher labor. Have to hire a carpenter or a plumber or an electrician. There are a whole lot more than used to be now. The good news is many of our communities we have volunteers. 
the material to home was more than double in these five years. That's, that's my argument for bumping this up. But I won't stand in the way of the section. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, hearing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Contrary, mind it nay. Okay, motion carried. Next, we have community announcements. Councillor Dewar. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a uh, came up kind of quick, and uh, we're very fortunate to be able to Suzanne is able to put it on the uh, website of ours. But anyway, so, uh, Information came from Gordon McGinnis of the Picton North Colchester Exhibition as it posted on Facebook. The Board of Directors are excited to be able to move forward with plans of the 2022 exhibition. The Scotchburn Fire Hall has been booked for March the 23rd at 7 p.m. So that's Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Uh, for a meeting for anybody interested in joining a committee or to help plan, organize, run an event of the exhibition. Any person in any of the commu uh, committees is encouraged to attend and in order to proceed with the exhibition plans. We need new committee members. Most of the committees still have a chairman, but we'd love to have others join them. Many hands make light work. Ideas for new events are also welcome. And if you have any questions beforehand, please contact me, which is Gordon, by email at pictaexhibition at gmail.com. Can you imagine I read that right? <laughs> <laughs> I've come a long way, right? Yeah, I'm just Okay, I'm just proud of you. Direct messages or a text or something, call me on my cell, which is 902 759 Everybody here is always interested in the exhibition. They always very, very supportive of our exhibition. But an awful lot of the people that were on those committees got some age on them now and some very important members of that committee in the last few years have passed away. And there's desperate, desperate big shoes to fill there now or boots. And even if a few counselors, or as many as can be, I'm hoping to be able to be there, and I'm sure it'll be some of the rest of us trying to get there. Uh, to just try to keep something going that's, if they had another year, like last year, the year before, no exhibition, it would just be a, it may be the end, right? And it's like everything else, it's like the 4 H for the kids. There's less and less interest and more and more qualifications that for leaders and it's just everything's getting so tough. So if anybody has any good ideas or wants to talk about anything, I'm sure they'll be able to on Wednesday evening at seven o'clock at the Scotsburn Fire Department upstairs. And everybody's totally fully welcome. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Dewar. Okay, Councillor Elliott. On Saturday, March 12th, I'm by the 4-H uh, Sunrise Trail Group, led by Bonnie Allen, done their public speaking and demonstrations at the Tommy Hall, and they were awesome, and they're real team players, and they showed the emotion that you would not believe, and the talent that they displayed was above and beyond, and Darla and I were honored to be the judges there for the day, and spend the whole day with that 4-H group, and it was awesome, and hats off to the Sunrise Trail 4-H group, they were wonderful. It was an awesome day. Those kids are amazing. The future leaders in our communities, and I know you know people say that, but it's it's true. They're awesome kids. Where are you? Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to uh, emphasize or reiterate uh, what Council Gilbert just said. This is so important to our community. The exhibition is on the verge of not surviving. It was with anybody on top do. And it's not just financial, it's, it's much about volunteers as it is about financial. Certainly we've been uh, able to help them, uh, you know, with some uh, grants over the years to help keep the old buildings up and whatnot. But, uh, you know, both Jack and Johnny are finished. 
But they, they're the two that have led this for, you know, and they're way past the time. They, they, but they kept on leading it because they wanted anybody else to step in. But uh, they lost, like everybody else, lost the 21 season, lost the 20 season. But people don't remember, they lost half of the 19 season because the hurricane came right in the middle of it. Uh, they had to close down for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So they lost the, the main income of the 19 season as well. So, uh, I think it has to be reborn almost uh, under some new leadership for sure. And that's what they're looking for. Uh, so I think each of us uh, in our districts, if we can, uh, with a school computer or whatever, encourage people to attend that meeting. A lot of people won't go to meetings because they're scared because uh, they're going to stick to something. They're going to let me, you know, be stuck on the committee, I'll be stuck doing something. So if you don't want to, you don't have to go on any committee. But if you can go and just give some input, or if you can encourage other people to go, uh, you know, because they, it can't be done uh, by one person. It's a huge job for the exhibition on it. And uh, it's it's still the big event in our county. Cook has always been big in this county. And uh, it's not dying, but it's changing. Uh, the size of our farms, the types of farms is changing. But uh, if, if we don't encourage that and encourage 4-H, which is part of agriculture, then, uh, you know, we're, we're all going to be the losers for it. Yeah, Absolutely, the exhibition takes place over just about a week, but it doesn't plan itself in a week, and it just that doesn't just magically come together like that for sure. Councilor Butler. Yes, Madam Chair, I'd like to bring to your attention the leaflet, leaflet that's on your desk. Uh, we're discussing the silent auction that's now taking place in this one, and it's to support our community hall. Um, bidding is started on the 15th of uh, March uh, online on Facebook and continues until April 1st. And then on the afternoon of the 2nd, uh, people will come up to the hall and, and uh, bid more on the auction item. So I would encourage you to look at the list. There's been a great deal of generosity on the part of the community and even the county near, nearby towns of uh, people and individuals that uh, have donated uh, to this uh, good cost. And uh, if you see something on there that you catches your fancy, feel free to bid like anyone else. Okay, thank you, Councillor uh, Butler. And thank you for bringing those tables for all of us to look at. Appreciate that. Go ahead, Councillor Bonner. Well, I better make an announcement. Uh, you got in your package, you already got an email in front of you there from Carolyn. Uh, Wayne Bones retiring as of. Uh, this is at least got another week and a half, two weeks left. So uh, we have the retirement party for Saturday, April 9th, from 2 to 4. It's a drop in thing, say whatever. And uh, at 3 o'clock, we're having a small presentation being made. So if any council can make it, nice to see you there. Thank you. Thank you, Council Number 3. Saturday, April 9th. Any other community community announcements? Okay, we'll move on to number twelve. Referrals to committee council and notices of motion. Okay, seeing none, I'll call for the adjournment. Been moved by Councillor Elliott. Second. Seconded by Councillor David Parker. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Contrary, mind it nay. Motion carried. Yeah, he, he can do it and none of us can do it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't, I have a record here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I acknowledge that. I call the officers for the meeting to order. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, to begin acknowledging that we are on the Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. And before we get started, Myself personally, I'd like to congratulate Jane and Carolyn for years of service and retirement. I hope you really enjoy it, and I thank you for all the years prior to me, me being counselor and when I became counselor for all the help and everything that you Thank you. Okay, next is the approval of the agenda. Okay. It's moved by Councilor Turner. Okay. Second by Councilor Dave Parker. All those in favor say yes, stay not. 
I'm going on the center with them. They, they, uh, the guys who are jumping in their ranks, so they save the money. They're paying less for the well center than they paid to the old John brother. And uh, the same with Salmon now Memorial, where he's gone. Whereas here in the county, we're, that's additional. We're, we're still paying to help the Pictou and the Thorburn and possibly the, the Westville ring. So uh, I just don't know where it's going to end as the cost goes up higher and higher, uh, you know, at the wellness center without, uh, and really, uh, I can voice my opinion there, which I've done many times, but um, it doesn't have much effect because I only have one one vote out of eight. So, uh, you know, the budget went ahead of where it was. Now, the one thing that, you know, this trust, the tax transfer trust has to decide if we're going to use 250000 this year uh, to help offset that deficit. So, which is what is down close to where we were last year, a little under. It doesn't change the deficit. It's just taking some money out of your bank account over here to help pay some bills this year. But that was proposed, and I'm, I'm in agreement with that, that it would be just to try and keep us from pumping any higher here. Uh, but that's a one-year thing. We've had really, really good income, you know, because all the places are selling. So if you have really good income over here, a really hard year over here, we're in deficit, then why not take some of this and supplement it for one year only? But it doesn't change the fact that our deficit has now grown to 1.2 million. And, uh, you know, efforts are being made, especially on the energy and the things to try and change that. But the other thing I wanted to update people on is that there's going to be a whole new structure of uh, who runs the well center. Uh, the, right now, we have three community volunteers sit on the board with the uh, mayor and myself. Uh, so that's going to change. It's going to be a community board, or I think it's a different name on it, but yeah, we have about 15 people from all over Pickle County. So they're going to do an awful lot of the work that we've done in the past as the board of governors. And uh, ours will be more, I wouldn't say rubber staffing, but it's more what comes from them will be, uh, we have to officially pass it because, you know, we're going back to the taxpayer, we're the people that are controlling that money. But uh, it's not a bad idea to have those people helping the uh, people that are running the wellness center. But um, I'm just a, a little leery if we're going to lose control over the, uh, the spending here eventually. We still have to prove it, but it comes, like it did last time, it's almost automatically approved once it comes. So there's a suggestion or a request to, in, in the motion to give them three year funding. That this new uh, uh, board of the uh, community board should have a three year funding. So, if we set that three year funding right now at 1.2 million, you know, based on the real bad years we had last year, um, it, it means that we're going to be living with that level of funding for the next three years, even if we do manage to save some on energy or we have a better year this year in terms of revenue, we'd be committed to three years at the 1.2. Uh, I can't agree to that, uh, you know, and so I, I don't know where that's going to go, but I want people around this table to realize, you know, when they hear that there's new boards that are running things, who that new board is and what they're doing, and uh, the fact that it could affect our uh, income substantially here, or our expense level, I should say. But anyway, I just want to update you on that, what took place last month. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Thompson. Just a question on that. Mr. Chair, uh, how much is the one of the 1.2 million dollars um, to cover the, the deficit for the uh, Pictou pool? I don't know if it's so much covering the deficit, but I know the 84,000 dollars is the figure that's often pretty consistent year to year. Has been for quite a few years now. At least the uh, if I go towards the pool, I don't think that's changed any. Uh, the last few years, the big increase is at the wellness center, and it's mostly for energy. Yeah, the Picto pool fluctuates a couple thousand dollars one way or the other, not a material big scheme of things. Anybody else? See nothing, Peter? No, you have you? I have a couple questions for the board. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, just on that community board. Is it going to be eyes or are they going on the pan pickable? 
think they're pretty well picked. We haven't seen the names yet that we're supposed to approve the names, but I haven't seen them. But I, I don't think it was advertised to my knowledge. So who's picking them? Just west side. The, the new, uh, the new, uh, what is the COO, Brian? Is that the COO? So, uh, Gray McNeil is the new uh, manager. He's the COO. So, what's the role of Miss Pally? And they come back to this here uh, community board come back here and say we need 1.5 million dollars this this year. Do you guys approve that? Still it has to be passed by the uh, uh, board of governors. Uh, but are you, I mentioned the other municipal units is still alive, so they don't see it. As they don't see it. They don't see it as a difficult situation you know, because they're not paying for other rates. Who came up with this idea of a community board? That's I think it came from the new CEO, but the, you know, the people around the board table agreed to it. See, I, I, I kind of disagree with it myself because the municipalities are the ones putting in the taxpayers. If you got a community board, they have no, no investment into the thing. You and that's part of the problem that I'm running into. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Hey, Dave. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Chair. Um, we had Ron Clark here this evening asking for a substantial sum of additional money for the Hector Arena, and I indicated I would be supportive. Uh, Any time that uh, the Adam McDonald Memorial Arena has come here asking for money, I have been supportive. And it's my understanding that the West Coast Arena may be making a pass. I have to support that because, in fact, that is the way that the people in my home community go. Uh, oh, uh, uh, it's very, very similar structure to the Hector. Well, the, how they, how they operate. So we are supporting three out of the four, or will be, I suspect, three out of the four smaller rinks in the county. And we've got this. I'll call it a white elephant sitting in the middle of our room and it's out of control. All the room nice the way, you know, real nice way to say that. And you're seeing that, that kind of increase. Now there's probably valid reasons, including COVID restrictions and so on. But despite what many of the towns think, we don't have unlimited resources. And our average taxpayer would be less able to support increases than the average taxpayer on the west side. Um, you know, how many times can you go to the west? What I'm asking. How far do we go? Yes, very supportive of hockey and drinks. It's part of our culture, our recreation. I think we want to continue to be supportive, but this white elephant has to be run out of control. Or it's not it's not stand by our recreational budgets. Thank you. Okay. Crazy people there. Okay. How's your deal? Uh thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I guess I have a, a comment and a question for the board. I too do not support having a community board in there, especially one that's not advertised as being handpicked. I think that if there's going to be a community board there, it should be reflective of the community. Um, and should be um, advertised in the community. It shouldn't. It shouldn't be handpicked. But I don't I think there, the, the, there's no, in my opinion, a true need for it. I mean, right now it's the stakeholders at the table already, um, and there's community members on that board already. So I find it quite redundant. I don't. I'm not really sure of the purpose that it would have moving forward. Um, we support. Um, well, the Hector Arena, we do very minimally in, in the grand scheme of things. Uh, with, 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 the, with the amount, I believe it's 15 every year that we contribute. Uh, we support the uh, Ivan McDonald rink very minimally every year. Um, and on the grand scheme of things, the money that we're putting in our community rinks now, it probably should be more. And, but we're, it just seems that the amount of money that's going into the wellness center um, when so many of our uh, 
residents are using not just the one rink, but all three. Uh, I understand it's, it's a different facility and, and so forth. Um, but I would be interested to know, you know, the percentage of residents that are using the wellness center as compared to the other three rinks or other two, uh, two to three rinks that are county that were possibly helping financially. Councilor Wolves. Oh, sorry. Uh, what I have a question on is just one question. Councilor Wolves, board. Only to see the voice of the board. Thank you for that question, Ryan. Uh, but um, I'm not sure we're not in this. Yeah. The, uh, the report was given the other day that the uh, 80% of, uh, of the users are from 20% of the population of the Center. Well, that's quite obvious because that's where it is. You know, it's, it's acting as the rank for both Nebraska and Southern only. You know, that's their only rank. Whereas we're, we've got our uh, young people spread, or not the young people, but we do spread over uh, three or four ranks. And so I don't know an exact number what the usage is, but uh, that was quoted at the last meeting that. 80% uh, of the UC jumps are going to the population, so you can draw from that. But there's probably more of our uh, users uh, using these smaller rinks uh, than there is using the wellness center. Now, I'm not able to say they're doing everything wrong with the wellness center. I mean, the new public to me, and he's painted with a new brush, and he was concerned that he didn't have enough help to run the place. He needed more advisory people with different skill levels and whatnot than what the group of mayor and board uh, have. And so that was sort of the, the uh, pretext that he asked for this community board. And uh, if used in the right way, but right now, uh, I, I feel that we, we need to control the amount of money that we're putting in. At some point, it has to be a stop. Uh, and things have to be done. And they are implementing this new energy thing, and that could help some, and other things could help some. But if we get fixed in for three years at the level we're at now, then no matter how much help we got it down to seven or eight hundred thousand, we'd be stuck at one point two right now. So I don't know why I couldn't agree to that. But I, I think the problem is that we're trying to support several rinks, and some will say, well, get rid of those other rinks, and that would solve the problem. I don't think that solves the problem at all. Because you suddenly have what, what hour, what time is the kids from outside of Petro or Thorburn or Wessel, you know. You know, if you only have the two rings in the well center, what hours do you can get you know, uh, available to, uh, to those people? So the bigger problem is just saying close morning. Okay. That's great. Sorry, Councilor Wolves. Yeah, I'm just. To me, I, I, as you say, much so might be coming on. I, I, for the life of me, I don't know what drinks are coming on because there's about so people used to drink the rink from, I mean, even the, uh, uh, the native state here, rather than they used it for their, their hockey and everything else. So I, I really don't know why they're not coming after us. But my thing is that really when, when it's all said and done, I think the Ivory McDonald is the one we should be really, one we should be looking after because, I mean, it is a county rink. It, it's in the county, and, and that's where our, 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 our county money should go. It's good to help the other ones, but some of the some of the money they're looking for, I think you know, it's just it's just well, from my point, it's a lot of money to give from our taxpayers to to other communities when we have our own way here. Can we put this on agenda for discussion for another night and go back to the reports? Because we can go around here talking about rates for half an hour. And uh, it's, a, it's a discussion we're going to have to end at some point. Yeah. So, uh, so I'd, I'd, uh, I'd ask for that, please. It may be uh, that way we can handle it. Yeah. Okay. We have almost 10 minutes. So we get a motion on the floor. All in favor say no. Say no. Motion carried. Okay, next on the agenda is Deer Hair Herd Management Recommendations. Councilor Dave Parker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I could go on all night with some of the uh, obvious evidence that we have a deer herd problem. Uh, 
uh, they've had it in town for quite a while. They haven't found it. Um, the evidence is clear to look around. Two major ways that it's impacting each and every rural resident uh, to grow a garden or to keep a few shrubs, and all these trees can do. Um, and the other way is on our insurance costs. Insurance companies keep track of where the deer closes are, and they rise for great rates accordingly. We have a lot of them, including one person. But that's not why I like to. Do what happens. Um, suggest and send a letter to Mr. Tory Reston, Minister of Financial Resources and Renewables, asking for a change, a specific change in the um, rules for harvesting deer. Uh, the option, one of the options available is that you must harvest a doe before you get a buck license. The harvesting box does zero to control the deer population. Unless you harvest every buck in an area, that's not going to happen. They more than willingly bring me those other doe, all the does in play. Um, so you have to, as cruel as it sounds, you have to shoot men. Okay? Female deer. That's the suggestion. But we send a letter to the resident to change the uh, license requirements that a female deer must be harvested in order to earn a permit for a buck deer. I'll second that. It's a problem. Who will second? Yeah, I'd like to thank uh, Councillor Park for bringing this up. This was brought up a number of years ago. We've had a really serious deer problem in particularly in Abercrombie and on the west side. Uh, I brought this up a number of years ago and it didn't really go anywhere, uh, but it, it's, it's migrated from, from what the Council for Park was saying from urban areas into rural areas now. And particularly in suburban areas, it's a real problem. Uh, my sister, um, she was downtown Stellarton and uh, her car right now is in uh, maybe be written off because a deer simply jumped out of the front of her, hit her grill, went up on her hood, smashed her windshield, and uh, so she's lucky she she wasn't injured. And that was right downtown Stellar. So we obviously have a problem. Um, we gladly second the motion. Uh, they've done a culling in Truro, which seemed to have some. Uh, 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 positive effects from all the information that I've gathered on it. So uh, I, it is a problem. I'm sure it's a problem to uh, any councillor in here that has um, urban or suburban areas in their districts. And as Councillor Parker said, it's become a rural problem as well. So gladly second this. Councillor Bowles. Yeah, I hear everything that I know. There's a, there's a, big, a big problem out there, and, and a lot of people getting into actions, hitting deers, and everything. But I think one of the biggest problems that's causing it, and I don't believe it ever fix it now, is the clear cutting. Or if they're taking their home away from them, and then so where are they going to go? They're coming to town and they're going to go. So I, I, I think that clear cutting has caused the big problem. Yeah. 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 I, I really have to respond to that. But it's absolutely the opposite. <clears throat> Clear cutting is wonderful for deer because it grows young growth. They need it. They had more babies. This started 35 years ago, but we did a lot of clear cutting. Okay? And, and the towns like to blame us for sending them their deer and cut down all the trees. It's the exact opposite. The population has exploded. Rush the uh, some of the articles in town. The same thing, right? My words happened to bears. It's going to be a lot more bear problems in towns this spring, next spring, the fall. Anyway, it's it's it, it's simplistic to say the clear cutting is the cause. Clear cutting has helped the deer in the rural areas, it's helped the coyotes too. And there are coyotes, and that's both the only control we have, and we don't have control over coyotes. Um, Hunters are one of the few tools that the resource managers have some ability to manipulate. Okay. Uh, the other thing I'm hoping for, have hoped for, and I've been working in the past, is, is severe winters. 
but severe winter is going to become less and less likely because of climate warming. We had a fairly tough winter this year. We also had some big thaws in the middle of it that allowed the deer to go into the fields for a few days, but the belly was back up. Anyway, it's, it's a big problem, and there's not a simple solution, and there's not a simple cut off that. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I think this I think this affects everywhere in our county. I, I come home every day and travel the rotary here picked up, and there's a sweet little herd of deer there, but it, you have to I think people are very vigilant now about vigilant about watching for deer because they're just everywhere. You never know where they're gonna be anymore. Um I will say I think a factor is is that we're expanding as people. We're we're moving. We have more subdivisions right now around. If you look in our urban areas, um, more suburban areas in in, in the county, um, which is great for growth of our county, which is necessary. But unfortunately, part of that is um, is, is the expansion of wildlife into those areas. Um, so I mean, we all see there's days where there's hundreds of deer on the side of the highway. Uh, on the little four. Um, I think I saw, I actually saw two deer jump the garden wheel tonight um, in caribou coming over. But uh, there's lots of wildlife around, that's for sure. Warden Park. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I know uh, it's a couple of days in that right the weather and the minister, anything I've heard the Department of Natural Resources saying that I expect we'll get something back it is that the air population is not that great, you know. They, I don't know what world they're living in, but I mean, around here and around everywhere, but they, they constantly say that no, we have a, a healthy deer population. Uh, but as long as they don't admit it's a problem, they're not going to be in a big hurry. There's, lots of, there's not lots of hunters, but some hunters left. But of the ones that are left, we've gradually harvested two or three deer. Some of them are anyway. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, I don't. Uh, I'll vote for the motion. I don't hold a lot of hope that we'll get a, a letter back saying they're going to look at it. And, um, they always seem to say, you know, our people say we've got a healthy population, so we may have to come up with a different strategy. Uh, but we'll explain this one out and see what happens. That's your thoughts. Your your ten minute time. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, just kind of two markers. <laughs> <laughs> Just a couple, couple things. I, you know, I went, went from, went to Thorburn for grade seven and eight, and during hunting season, I didn't realize that I, I'm not a hunter, so, um, but half the boys in the class, they were gone for two weeks. They, they just, where are they? Oh, they're all gone. They went hunting with their, their father. It wasn't, it wasn't a gun in the house for me, but, um. <laughs> I don't think there's, uh, I, I'd be curious to know if there's any hunters left. Um, we should be paying them actually. Um, but the other the other thing is, is when, when years ago, we just let our dogs out. Now you can. Our dogs, yeah, that's our, dog. our dogs used to chase deer into the woods. They, if you're in, if you're in the subdivision now, you have to have your dog unleashed. To, 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 I think the deer taunt them now. Yeah, um, but and the other thing is just don't feed the deer. There's still people feeding deer, like it's crazy. But anyway, it's not dangerous. Anybody else? No, I agree that there's, there's, there's the deer population seems to be growing, and I, I think one of the issues is there are less hunters up there. I don't think you have there there are the hunters that used to be there. So anyway. Motion on the floor. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Caroline, nay. Motion here. Next is the Hillside Lift Station Overflow. Councilor Boyles. Yeah, I, I think if you look at the uh, our financials over the last while, and the uh, money we've been paying out around, you know, when there's a storm of any kind down there at that lift station hillside, it's, it's just unbelievable. I mean, the last from there, the water was almost ready up to go over the road. In fact, the person was on the road. And, uh, you know, uh, Logan was saying there, you know, expected to get uh, to 